This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the Eau Claire Area School Board. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. Thank you everyone for your patience. We had a little audio issue. Hopefully it is resolved. We're not going to mess with it. Uh, so we'll, we'll start again from the beginning. Call to order. Those of you who are willing and able, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dana, if you could do a roll call for our quorum. Commissioner Clements. Here. Commissioner Harder. Here. Commissioner Lyons. Here. Here. Commissioner Nordine. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Zur. Here. Commissioner Bika. Here. Thank you. And we are in compliance with open meeting laws. Yes. All right, our first order of business tonight is a public hearing to discuss an application for an educator effectiveness waiver. We have no public comments on this item, so we'll go directly to Superintendent Johnson for our presentation. Good evening, Chair Nordine, Commissioners, Student Representatives, and Executive Team members. Tonight, administration requests flexibility from fulfilling the six minimal requirements of the Educator Effectiveness System for the 2020-2021 school year. We're applying for this waiver so our staff can prioritize the day-to-day, moment-to-moment instructional delivery for both in-person and virtual teaching and learning in the Eau Claire Area School District while meeting the ever-changing needs of our students and families at this uncertain time. On the second slide, here is the statute. You may note that it had begun in 2014-15, and I'm well aware of the amount of work and detail principals, district leaders, and teachers must devote to this. I participated with a school level group in the DPI pilot in 13-14 when I was the director of academic services in River Falls. The third slide details what the waiver for educator effectiveness is. Waiving the requirement of the school board slash district to evaluate the effectiveness of each teacher and principal based upon measures of student performance and the extent to which the teachers or principals practice meet specified core teaching standards or educational leadership policy standards. This application provides us the ability to apply for regulatory flexibility needed to implement our plans for restarting and delivering our blended and virtual models in the midst of the pandemic. I have been part of meetings on this at the state level and in discussions with other districts. I have also consulted with Tamara Mowell from the DPI on our waiver application. Larger districts like Racine and Stevens Point have already applied for and received waivers, and there are more to follow. Applications are accepted on a rolling basis at any time during the year. Finally, on our last slide, due to the amount of planning and preparation necessary during the spring and summer to launch our blended model of instruction in the district, we've been unable to provide a sufficient level of infrastructure, evaluator, and educator training, initiation steps, implementation of basic educator effectiveness system elements, refinement structures, and the system monitoring necessary to enhance learning. Eau Claire is the third largest school district in the state to implement a blended instructional model. This took a tremendous amount of time and resources in the spring and summer, which takes away valuable time from this process. Furthermore, we have altered our administrative positions of eight of our principals and assistant principals, which further impacts their ability and indirects, indirectly impacts their colleagues' ability to implement the system equitably for their respective teaching staff. We're experiencing an increase in responsibilities on our staff due to teaching in person and virtually because of COVID-19, as well as teachers being repurposed and reassigned both virtually and in person due to COVID, mit COVID mitigation requirements. Due to this reality, we do not have the ability to properly implement all program rules and requirements of educator effectiveness. We will utilize our annual performance review, otherwise known as APR system, to evaluate all staff. This will enable us to evaluate them equitably as many staff have far different positions and responsibilities based on their medical waivers, repurposing, and reallocation. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent Johnson, I've been informed that we did in fact have one member of the public who was wanting to speak on this issue, so we will uh, go to them now. Uh, we will have the four minute time limit as we do in our regular public forum. Uh, that member of the public is Lucinda Kemet.
Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I just had some questions. I didn't I didn't know if this was like a comment or a back and forth for questions. And so as I was reading, I'll just list the four questions I had. And if there's some, something that the Superintendent Johnson wants to address or the board thinks are important to answer, then I'll leave these with you. The first question was, is this a way is this waiver effective for four years? Um, because as I'm reading about the statutes of being granted waivers, it looks like all waivers are intended to be four years. Um, you've already answered the alternate means of evaluation of teachers. Um, so we can scratch that question. Second question, will the district still be doing state testing as a measurement tool for the district performance? And finally, are teachers planning to be able to cover the entire core curriculum for 2021? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kevin. Uh, we'll now open the floor to board member questions as well. Um, Superintendent Johnson, I think each of those three questions are probably fairly simple uh, answers. So I guess I will start by asking you if you if you are willing to address those three questions that Ms. Kemet asked, I would be happy to hear those answers. Absolutely. I'll take the first one and then I'll defer to our executive director of teaching and learning or um, administration, either Kim or Jim. Um, first off, the waiver is uh, for one year and it could be applied for the following year, but those are for uh, that is for one year and that's been very clear to us as superintendents. So number one should be answered. Uh, state testing. Oh, I'm sorry, you Elijah. Um, so we are still planning for state <laughs> testing. Um, we've not received any waivers, so that's still part of our plan. And um, for core curriculum, we have developed um, and continue to revise our essential learning outcomes, which identifies uh, what every student is supposed to be able to know and do by the end of the year. Thank you. Questions or comments from board members? Seeing none, I would hear a motion to approve the application for an educator effectiveness waiver. Second. Moved by Commissioner Zer, second by Commissioner Clements. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. We'll now move on to our regular public forum. The public will have four minutes per person to address the board, providing that they have new or additional information that has not been previously shared at the meeting. The school board will not hear personal complaints of school personnel nor any person connected with the school district. Uh, we have three, oh, we, sorry, we have four uh, members of the public for public comment tonight. Our first is Bob Crone. Good evening, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, so good evening. I'd just like to start by uh, thanking the district administration and, and the school board members uh, for your efforts in navigating what's a, uh, you know, definitely a challenging year for everyone, um, but especially uh, difficult uh, on the children in our district. Um, I just wanted to comment and, and would like to urge the district administration and the school board to push toward reopening our schools and opening up all extracurricular activities and the, and the athletic programs. Uh, other surrounding districts have found solutions for this uh, and they were prepared to offer five days a week of in-person classes and avoid canceling extracurricular activities and athletics. Um, I know there's many dynamics that go into that, but, but you know, others did find a way. Um, it's unfortunate for the kids in our community that the Eau Claire School District uh, defaulted to shutting down in-person learning and all extracurricular activities. I'd like to ask the district to, to reevaluate their decisions and move toward the reopening uh, based on facts, unbi unbiased data, and evidence. And please resist the temptation to make decisions based on the emotions of fear, unfounded assumptions, bias, or any political agenda of any kind, including any bias that may exist within the Eau Claire County Health Department. The students and families of the Eau Claire District are counting on you to make decisions based on facts and not emotions. Current data and facts do not support the closure of our schools and the shutdown of the lives of school-aged children. We can and should be prepared to adjust if the facts and data were to change, but at this point we're doing more harm than good to our children by shutting down in-person learning and extracurricular activities. Consider the fact 
that the best available evidence indicates that COVID poses extremely low risks to school-aged children. Consider the fact that deaths of children due to COVID are less than in each of the last five flu seasons, and we've never shut down a thing due to the risk of influenza. Consider the fact that the statistical likelihood of a school-aged person dying from COVID is zero. And yes, zero if you're under the age of 19. Data also shows that school-aged children are not the spreaders of COVID that many feared and have hypothesized. The data shows that there are very few reports across the country of children being the primary source of transmission among family members. Now, fear and bias tempt us to think differently, but the data proves otherwise. And although we, we still have a, much more to learn about COVID, we actually have learned a lot so far. We have learned that COVID does not pose a risk to school children that is any greater than the flu or any other virus or anything else that poses a risk to young people. So I urge you to focus on what we do know. We do know that the harm attributed to closed schools and activities on the social, emotional, behavioral, mental health, economic well-being, and academic achievement of children in both the short term and the long term are in fact well known, well, well documented, and significant. Said more bluntly, the decision to close schools and shut down extracurricular activities in the Eau Claire district will cause far more direct harm to the children in our district than COVID ever will. This is based on data and facts void of emotion or bias. I would encourage you all to read the publication on the CDC website that outlines the importance of reopening schools and provides specific references, data, and research that supports this importance. So in closing, I'd like to request that the district provide transparency to whether or not there is a plan to open up in-person learning and extracurricular activities and athletics for our students. And if so, what exactly is that plan and when will those decisions be made? Students and families are wanting to know the direction the district will take before evaluating alternatives outside of our district. And if there are individuals that are not comfortable with attending in-person learning or participating in extracurricular activities, then by no means. Thank you. Again, I'm sorry, but we do have a four minute limit. Our second uh, speaker tonight is Randy Gerber. Good evening, can you hear me? Yeah. As a parent of three students in the district and as an employee of ECSD, I want you all to know that my thoughts and feelings come from a place of deep compassion to see that all students will succeed, no exception. The people with whom I work with every day and the educators that my kids have been incredibly blessed to have are my biggest heroes and they are largely the reason why I wanted to become a member of this highly educated, incredibly talented, an amazingly compassionate group of professionals. With that being said, my heart breaks daily by the exhausted and overwhelmed sentiments from teachers within my building and other buildings and families from all over our district with regards to our current hybrid and virtual learning options. I feel that our board and administration has been less than transparent with its staff, families of ECSD and our students. My frustration is mounting with the lack of preparation and planning by our board and administration for our students and staff to return to school in person five days a week this school year. I would like to know why so much effort, time and resources are being put into solidifying a calendar that maintains the current hybrid and virtual models of learning for the rest of the 2021 school year. Why have these same efforts, resources and time been spent planning for a complete shutdown of in-person learning and moving to 100% virtual for all, rather than planning for a successful five day a week in-person school model, which is working very well for many of our surrounding school districts. In this fluid situation, our board needs to be able to adapt when science and data has shown the minimal effects of COVID-19 on the majority of our population. There is a growing body of evidence that says that school aged children are not as likely to be infected and not as likely to transmit infection. You need to look at the data for yourselves and be willing to adapt to policy and procedures that match our county statistics and specifically our district statistics. We should be able to trust in our district administration and school board that they are making decisions based on data and facts. 
We need and deserve evidence based policies and plans in place that benefit the majority of students and families. We need and deserve accountability from our board and administration as to whom and what data is guiding you to make these restrictions that simply do not match the risks. If the goal here is zero cases of COVID to return to five days of in person learning this, this school year, truly re realistic. We are at risk of viral infection every single day and COVID is no different. For years as a district, we have been practicing how we can be equitable for all, and we are constantly working on closing the achievement gap. Yet this current model is the farthest from equitable. Our district has created an unfair strain on families who are already struggling financially, whose children are falling behind academically and struggling socially and emotionally. And with this current model, there are major gaps that grew after the district shut down in March and will likely continue to grow rather than close. As a district, you have taken away some of the most fundamental pieces that come along with being part of a school community, not allowing kids opportunities to succeed in activities outside of the classroom, from athletics, fine arts, and clubs. It's robbing them of a well-rounded and diverse educational and school experience. Again, the lack of equity comes to mind. Our district has a duty to provide a fair and balanced education and school experience for students. And what be done now to get all students who choose to back to school five days a week for in-person learning, rather than putting more resources, effort, and time into maintaining the current model or moving to 100% virtual. Thank you. Thank you. Our third speaker tonight is Lori Pankratz. Hello. Hello. Hi, I'd like to start off with some positive feedback. So Superintendent Johnson, thank you for sending out the proposed changes to the school year calendar. I think it was last week or maybe the week before, even though the news of the changes were a bit of a late surprise, the attempt to keep us up to date on the possibilities of what those changes could look like was appreciated. Thank you also for listening and giving parents the opportunity to be involved on committees for sports and activity planning in partnership with the schools as we move forward. I really think that would be productive. Also, thank you for the addition of the COVID-19 dashboard on the district website. It is extremely helpful to see those numbers in real time. And those numbers continue to look promising with, I believe it's two students and four staff currently positive in the district. I have a couple of questions specific to the calendar year um, regarding the number of contact instructional hours that are required by the DPI each year. I'm curious if any hours on Wednesdays will be included in that count of instructional time. If so, um, I would argue that including any hours on Wednesday would be a misrepresentation of what is actually happening. Along with that, how many instructional contact hours of the cohort virtual days are being counted? I'd be interested in those numbers. Um, I have some numbers on my end if you're interested in hearing those. Um, why the district calendar? I think this was already mentioned, maybe Randy mentioned it. I'm wondering why the district calendar shows cohort learning through the end of the school year. Is there any active planning taking place for our students to re-enter the system? At the last board meeting, you discussed how the transition to all virtual would take place, um, which is, of course, a necessary consideration, but there was really no talk of any type of plan for reopening, and I'm curious where that stands and who's working on that. Uh, lastly, historically, there's been a shortage of substitute teachers in the Eau Claire Area School District. Um, why is that? And who is um, investigating the reasoning for that shortage? What is the plan to alleviate any additional stress on the system when teachers take planned personal days when they might need a mental break from the stressors of the current situation, when they need to be in quarantine because of exposure, or when they are actually sick? Is there any plan in place to alleviate additional stress on the system so that we can accommodate for those circumstances to avoid a shutdown, not due to COVID numbers, but due to a shortage of teachers? Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker for public comment tonight is once again, Lucinda Kemet. Hello, thank you again. I was just emailing Marissa, um, Bob and Randy and Lori have covered the exact topics on my list. With the exception of, I wanted to thank you for receiving the 
letter that I put together. This was a petition that I sent out to just people softly through Facebook. There was no pressure to sign, simply saying, if you agree with the way I have phrased this information, please add your name to the list. And as you saw, I think there were 268 people who added their name to the list. So for the school board members who received it and haven't read it yet, I would greatly appreciate your feedback on just knowing that you have received it because I feel like I'm representing the 268 people that signed it. Um, and furthermore, the third and, and Superintendent Johnson, thank you very much for your email today. I will share that with the people that um, have asked me to share the feedback. Um, the only thing that's kind of left outstanding based on your feedback is the need for bringing in resources to understand the impacts of this situation on the mental health of our students. There are a lot of mental health professionals in the community that I think could speak to this. And I just encourage you to continue to look both ways before you cross the street. There is a significant potential risk to the continued closure of schools. I feel like the harm that we are doing, like Bob said, with keeping kids out of school far supersedes the potential of the harm from the virus. And I expect our school board, we trust our school board to be advocating for the kids. And that might mean challenging the health department. That might mean asking questions and expecting real data that shows you how the current science is making this situation the best for our kids. So I encourage you to really ask lots of questions, challenge everything that you're hearing, do your own research, and we trust you to do the best for our kids. Thank you so much. Thank you. We now move on to our board and administrative reports. We start with the superintendent's report, Mr. Johnson. Good evening again. Um, the week since our last board meeting have gone by quickly. There's much to report. We continue to receive updates from City County Health and contact schools and families when schools are impacted by any positive virus cases and learning about other local and state school districts data. I'm really pleased with our data and the few numbers of close contacts identified. As uh, was alluded to in public comment, our district dashboard was recently updated this morning. While other Wisconsin school districts have recently experienced changes in the re reopening plans this September, like Hudson, our district has steadily served our kids and families while adhering to the Eau Claire City County Health Plans to guide our decisions. After our agenda setting two weeks ago Tuesday, I visited schools and had a virtual meeting with a mentor of mine, Dan Hooverman. Dan's retired former superintendent of the Moundsview School District, and his former district is quite similar to Eau Claire in many respects. My former district had worked closely with Dan on our equity work, and I scheduled a monthly meeting with him for my own professional development. Dan and I spoke at length about our coherent governance progress, equity, our transition planning efforts, our virtual progress and communication, and our organizational structure. I then spent time with Maida Miski and learning about the Family Advisory Council and my involvement, as well as budget and finance with Abby Johnson. We continue to progress on transition plan, virtual ed, and our COVID data and protocols. Later that week, I was able to visit DeLong, Sherman, and Roosevelt and able to observe classrooms. Obviously, these are the highlights of the day for anyone in a district office position. We also had our meet and confer with select members of the ECAE Executive Board, including two principals, Laura Schlichting and Travis Hedke. Mark Goings facilitated the meeting. I believe we were able to answer questions, provide information, and address concerns of the association. Earlier this past week, I was able to visit Northwoods, Longfellow, Lakeshore, and McKinley Charter. Always enjoy listening to Pete Riley and his programming and structures for his students and staff. Finished an afternoon with the equity and advocacy team from four to five. Had an excellent discussion about the equity work and structures that must occur throughout the district. My own accountability measures re related to equity and how to ensure all schools participate and receive what they need to learn and grow. This past Wednesday, I then had a meeting with Abby Johnson and a Zoom call on October school finance with Deputy State Superintendent Mike Thompson and others. This was very helpful to participate in this call with about 250 superintendents and their school business finance leaders, where I was able to sit with Abby and ask her questions related to finance and impact on our school system. Later on, I was able to meet with the art teacher from Sam Davey, Ms. Danielle Johnson, who delivered some artwork from the entire district elementary school collection. We placed select artwork on the walls of our district office, returning the previous year's artwork to the students and families. Later that day, we did send out notification on calendar items in the early evening to staff and families about our proposed changes 
for this year, and those changes will be discussed and presented for approval this evening. Later in the week, I contacted our activities directors about their continued plans to reach out to parents in their preparation for offering activities and athletics in the winter and subsequent seasons as well. In mid-October, they will be offering an opportunity, as was discussed in public comment, for one parent representative from each sport and activity each high school to inform, educate, provide a forum for concerns and questions, and solicit creative problem-solving measures when we do encounter difficulties in the months ahead. I also had my first meeting with CESA 10 superintendents, and that was very helpful in getting to see some familiar faces, be informed about legal updates, and learn a bit about regional issues. Last Friday was National Custodial Workers Day. I want to personally thank our dedicated custodial staff throughout the district for all they do to keep our students and staff safe and healthy. We feel much more secure because of your commitment to the district, and thank you. October is National Principals Month. I'm so very grateful for all principals have done since the start of the school year, the way in which they field calls, address concerns, comments, and questions, communicate with so many, support their staff members, and display leadership in such difficult circumstances is very impressive. I'm very fortunate to work with all of them. It certainly must be a celebration week because starting today, board members, it is Wisconsin School Board Week. Thanks to all of you for your hard work and dedication to Eau Claire students in our community at this uncertain time. We're very proud to work on your behalf. Finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to our entire staff for their role in making this past month a successful one, given the uncertainty surrounding it. Your resiliency, patience, creativity, and support this September has been outstanding. I'm reminded of this often, most notably when I've walked by your classrooms, both in person and virtual. Thank you again for all you are doing for students and families. Thank you, Superintendent Johnson. We now move to the board president's report. At this point, we are fully one month into the school year, and I can't quite decide if it feels like one week or one year. <laughs> uh, either way, I wanted to take a moment tonight on behalf of the board to reflect on the last month of our extraordinary school year. We entered into a plan for our blended model in July because we know how important it is for our students to be able to interact with teachers who care about them and learn alongside their peers. We looked hard at the academic, social, emotional, and societal impacts of this decision as well as our commitment as a board, as a district, and as a community to doing our part to help slow the spread of COVID-19. We continue to evaluate those questions on a day-to-day -day basis. We also decided to offer an all-virtual option to those families who were not able to return to school in this way. It was not a decision that we made lightly, but instead with the knowledge that no decision was perfect and that challenges would be faced by all of us in changing the model of education for this school year. And it was not a decision made in isolation, but it was a team effort that involved a staggering number of voices, data points, and science. It continues to be that kind of effort to this day. There were and are challenges. Families have had to alter their schedules for work and life to fit around their children being in school two days per week. This on top of a time when much outside of school is also uncertain. Students have had to adjust to virtual lessons, wearing masks in our school buildings, and to not seeing friends in the same ways that they used to. We know that sacrifices have been made to make this work. We want you to know that we hear your struggles and that the board and the district together are striving every day to find ways to support our students and families. We will continue to listen and continue to work together to serve this community. Our teachers and staff have faced challenges as well. And rather than complaining about the difficulties in moving to a new model that few of us have ever experienced, they have risen with a willingness to help be a part of the solution. Every week and every day, our teaching staff is working to improve the systems, methods, and operations of our schools. If you will forgive me some melodramatic language, our teachers and staff from top to bottom have shown why we so often call them heroes. While this is not to say that our struggles are over, we have seen how effective our amazing staff can be under nearly impossible circumstances. As we have so often, we thank you for the work that you continue to do and the service that you provide for our children. We will continue to stand with you and improve every day and work to find solutions as challenges arise. I'm happy to report that the precautions and systems we have in place seem to be working. While we have had cases of COVID reported in our schools, we have had little to no transmission of the virus among our students and staff. 
Because we took the time to set these protocols in place, we have been able to keep our students and staff safe in our schools. And we have been able to do so in a way that allows us to have planned and supported effective learning in a partly or 100% virtual model. As Superintendent Johnson mentioned, we are now seeing other districts quarantining large swaths of their students and staff and forced to move to blended programming from five day face to face programming with little to no lead time for teachers. While we have been working on our program for many months, we continue to live the commitment of our board and our district to provide our students and staff an environment that allows for them to learn and teach safely, effectively and consistently. And we are preparing for the future. While Wisconsin sees an alarming spike in COVID cases across the state and here within Eau Claire County over the past few weeks, our administration has worked in concert with staff and community members to make changes for safely moving to an all virtual model if we experience outbreaks within our schools. It is essential that we have plans in place for this eventuality, as was also noted in public comment today. We will hear more about those plans later on tonight. But beyond that, plans those plans include work being done to return to full face-to-face -face instructions when we can safely do so. I know I speak for almost all of you when I say that we look forward to the day when we can have our students and teachers together again on a daily basis. That is the end goal of our current model and all our planning. By making our school systems safer for our students and staff and for our community, we make our community as a whole safer and help bring that time when we can put this behind us closer. Our board remains committed to this work. We know that this year continues to be challenging and that the sacrifices that you are making are formidable. We want you to know that we are with you and that we will continue to do our best every day to help provide a safe, equitable, and supportive learning environment. Thank you. We now move on to our student representative's report. We'll start with our representative from Memorial High School, Emory Tool. Hello, can you guys all hear me all right? Can, thank you. All right, I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm gonna talk about the hybrid model first. I am hearing continued comments from students that it's going well. I just hear a few comments this week about masks being worn incorrectly or people eating in class, so without their masks. Um, so increased guidance for teacher and staff on how to enforce the new dress code may be beneficial. Um, as for virtual, I think things are generally improving, but there are sort of two different paths. So I want to break it down a little bit further. Virtual classes taught by ECISD teachers. So from my understanding, most or all of like the non AP classes and then some of the AP classes too are going very well. For the most part, teachers and students are settling in and it's going well for the students I heard from. Of course, they're still adapting to do, but it certainly has improved from last month and it's continuing to improve. Um, virtual classes taught through APEX are a bit of a different story. Um, that would make up most of our AP classes. They are not going as well. There's still quite a bit of confusion regarding textbooks, which is creating anxiety about falling behind without access to those materials, especially as we approach that first month back in school. Um, there's also a general sense of disappointment amongst AP students who don't feel that the switch to APEX was really communicated to them before they had to choose between the hybrid and virtual models. And some students I spoke to said that that would have affected their choice of a model. Um, in spite of this, I would say that things are overall going much better, um, though there remain some improvements to make across the board. And I hope to uh, explore some improvements with Mr. Oldenburg and Mr. Johnson and some other um, administrators uh, at Memorial. Thank you. We'll now turn to our representative from North High School, Zoe Wolf. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a great evening. My report tonight will be an update on how the virtual part of the blended model at North, North is going and the overall atmosphere of the student body. The on-campus learning feels normal and it is going smoothly smoothly, but I have yet to see the necessary improvements in online learning. There are many different class structures that teachers are using, which can be confusing. For example, some teachers require students to sign into Canvas on every virtual day, otherwise we get marked absent, or the assignments just need to be completed and it doesn't matter which day you do them. It seems as though the teachers have not been given direct instructions on what the curriculum this year should look like, 
and if they did, it has not been communicated to the students very well. I do not think most teachers are at fault. It is simply misdirection. I do realize that different teachers have various styles of teaching, so there are going to be differences, but the online portion is not organized well. Being a student, I see many of my peers falling behind in courses that should be pretty straightforward. Overall, there needs to be more communication between the district, students, and teachers. I was unable to get in contact with the student doing completely virtual, but as I last heard, it is even more disorganized than the blended model, but is going better than before this year. Finally, I do have some positive news to share. Different organizations are adapting to the new guidelines and are beginning to come together again. For example, Student Council is in partnership with the Northern Wisconsin State Fairgrounds to have a socially distanced drive-in movie night on the 13th. Also, Student Council is planning volunteer events around the community, like leaf raking for the residents around North and having the annual blood drive at Hope Lutheran Church on October 26th. In addition, sports are beginning to have practices and clubs are allowed to have socially distanced meetings. And you can see how happy the students are to get back to some normalcy. There is a shift in the morale at North and it is moving in a positive direction. We all need to do our part to stay safe during these trying times and that will always be the number one priority. So it is great to see these organizations coming together again and finding safe ways to do so. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to our school board committee reports. We'll start as always with budget development. Commissioner Harder. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, we did meet last week for Budget Development Committee, and uh, we spoke about the um, the budget uh, the budget planning that's that's happening right now. And we're going to have a quite a long update on that as part of our agenda this evening. So I won't go into too much detail. Um, but uh, we will uh, we have planned to to meet again, depending on what comes out of that uh, discussion here in, in the meeting tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to demo and trends. Ms. Kohler. Uh, demographics, trends, um, and facility planning hasn't met since the last meeting. Thank you. Uh, LEAP, Mr. Schmidt. Uh, LEAP meets next week, um, but in the meantime, uh, we are awaiting the first preview of that meeting of the innovation video that's been developed, uh, the first draft by the Donovan Group and the communication plan for sharing with the district and the community um, the role of the Arctic Zone in the North Star community. Thank you. Policy and Governance met Thursday, September 24th, and continued its work on Policy 343, dealing with instructional grouping. Uh, I'm optimistic that we will have that policy ready for board review soon. Dr. Johnson and Kay Marks led another strong discussion on our hiring and retention practices. And Dr. Johnson shared the report, A Teacher Who Looks Like Me, from the Wisconsin Policy Forum, uh, dealing with the demographics of Wisconsin's teaching staff as compared to the changing demographics of our school population. Uh, board members who would like a copy of that report, I was furnished to policy and governance, uh, can request it, I'm sure, from Dr. Johnson or myself. Uh, the report is also available at wispolicyforum.org. That's wispolicyforum.org. Policy and governance will meet again this Thursday at 1 p.m. We'll now turn to the legislative updates, Dr. Johnson. The State Department of Health Services and Wisconsin Emergency Management are working on the project to receive federally available masks. The state received a shipment of cloth face masks from the Department of Health and Human Services the week of September 14th. However, the amount the state received is half of what it had been expecting, and the masks that were received are all size for adults, uh, in this case, middle and high school students. The Department of Health Services and Department of Emergency Management would like to start distributing these by early October. However, it is unknown exactly when the state will receive the youth size cloth mask. The Joint Legislative Council hosted the symposium series on early access to autism treatment throughout the month of September. The symposium presented information on barriers to Wisconsin families, children, and assessing early diagnosis and treatment of autism. The four sessions focused on early childhood autism screening and diagnosis, access to early behavioral treatments, individual and family experiences and pathways to diagnosis, treatment and support, policies affecting payment for autism related services. Recording, recorded sessions are available for viewing on the Joint Legislative Council website. On September 16th, Health and Human Services 
released a report outlining how it will quickly work with states to distribute doses when an effective vaccine is identified. According to the National School Board Association, the first wave of vaccination may include people with health vulnerabilities, the elderly, and healthcare providers who work with COVID-19 patients. The second wave may include people at increased risk of acquiring or transmitting COVID-19, which includes employees of schools, childcare centers, colleges, and universities. On September 22nd, Governor Evers declared a new public health emergency in Wisconsin due to uh, recent surges in cases among young people and issued a new face covering order effective immediately until November 21st or until challenged in Wisconsin's courts. Governor Tony Evers announced on September 23rd that more than $5 million of funding from the Federal CARES Act will be awarded for expansion of high-speed broadband internet. Funding will be awarded to you by the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin to applicants from the 2020 broadband expansion grants that did not receive funding and are able to connect customers by December 30th, 2020. On September 23rd, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards sent a letter to legislative leadership on statutory flexibilities. Areas requested to be considered include all of the following. Broad flexibility in teacher and professional staff licensure. Retired teacher staff returning to work. Pupil counts, specifically September, January, and summer school. Transportation aid. Immunity from civil liability for schools. Open, open enrollment space determination. Long-term capital improvement trust fund flexibility student assessment, school and school district performance reports. On September 28th, the Office of School Safety, school Safety announced a newly updated sixth edition of the Safe Schools Legal Resource Manual. Whether or not schools have a school resource officer, schools will need to work with law enforcement. This document highlights issues as it pertains to parent notification, staff presence during interviews with agency personnel, students' rights, and then searches and more. Also, the Office of School Safety released a statement regarding school safety drills during the pandemic. There has not been a statutory change to Wisconsin Statute 118074, which requires that pupils are drilled in the proper response to a school violent event in accordance with school safety plan in effect for that school building. Schools previously considered the age of the students and school specific practices when designing such drills. However, in the case of uh, COVID-19, uh, things will have to be reconsidered. So in planning, first, schools should consult their local health department regarding social distancing and protective practices and follow any guidelines regarding, regarding masks, et cetera. Additional guidance regarding tornado and fire drills has been provided by the Department of Public Instruction in their updated COVID-19 regulatory flexibility framework provisions for 2021. A push to suspend student assessment requirements for academic year 2020-21 is being undertaken by a few organizations, and these organizations include Wisconsin Association of School Board, Southeastern Wisconsin School Alliance, School Administrators Alliance, Wisconsin's Education Association Council, and they have a, uh, a pretty thorough statement as it relates to of uh, reasoning to suspend student assessment. I would encourage those who are interested to, to visit the Wisconsin Education Associated Council website. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to our consent agenda. Consent agenda is acted on with one vote without discussion. If a board member wishes to discuss any item, it will be pulled out of the consent agenda and voted on separately. Tonight's items are the minutes of September 21st, 2020, Human Resources Employment Report, Retire Policy 542 Employment Compensation Plans, Retire Policy 542.1 Support Staff Employee Salaries Slash Fringe Benefits, Retire 545 Policy Support Staff Assignment and Transfers. I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? And abstaining. All right, we'll now move on to our individually considered resolutions. Our first item tonight is the 2020-2021 calendar modifications. The 
Good evening. I am uh, going to share my screen. Uh, is that is that showing up on everyone else's or no? Not here. Uh, it says on the presenter. Uh, Marissa, can you confirm on um, my computer is the presenting screen? Oh, here we go. There we go. All right, now we have a gym. All right, thank you. All right, good evening. Um, so the this report will share the calendar modifications for um, if we are in uh, the Eau Claire City County Health Plan steps A through E. So um, this would not apply if we are in the safer in the safer home order or if we are in um, Plan Step F, which is full time return to school. So the um, the current adopted calendar uh, again, this is what we would be using in that. Um, in that situation, if we were in Safer at Home or Plan Step F. And this current uh, plan has uh, five professional development and instructional planning days. Um, as we've received requests from families through our feedback, especially at the Family Advisory Council, families asked when we prepare this calendar for a minimum, minimize the number of different breaks that occurred. Um, they would prefer a number, a smaller number of breaks, but make those breaks longer rather than a number of smaller breaks. So, in other words, They'd rather see one four-day weekend instead of two three-day weekends. Um, this one also has snow makeup days, and if you can recall back, if you were watching our our um, about two years two school years ago when we were trying to determine how to make up days, um, that was a big deal because uh, we did not have a mechanism in place for snow makeup days uh, other than to extend the school year and to use those, um, those some of those professional development and instructional planning days. So. This is the calendar that had been approved uh, leading into the school year. And our recommendation tonight is that we use this if we are in Safer at Home or uh, we are in Plan Step F. The reason for using this adapted calendar still in those two is that there is no difference in instructional model for our students. Everyone is under the same plan. And so the next model that we're going to share with you is really um, for when we are in Plan Steps A through E, which does put students in a variety of different cohorts actually puts them in four different groupings. So the, um, as I listened to the um, discussion at the beginning of the presentation, um, I like to remind us why we are even looking at this calendar model. Um, the need to shift to this model really comes down to ensuring that we have that six foot di social distance between um, everyone in the building. And we literally do not have enough space nor adults to accommodate all students at one time in that model. We really don't fit. Uh, it works out well in the summertime and, and, and nice fall and spring days, but it really doesn't work beyond that. So we really run into a logistics of space limitation and capacity of our humans, our adults, to be able to um, support um, support the, the students that would be in the building or in whatever extended um, space that we were able to, to try to create. We also know um, that this shift does reflect um, uh, the instructional model that was approved by the school board back on July 20th. And this, uh, this draft, of course, um, which reflects plan step A through E, um, we feel encouraged by um, the work from outside organizations like Mathematica that has shown that a hybrid model um, can actually be less disruptive to the educational process than a full-time model uh, where an outbreak occurs and you have to shut school down, ranging from a number of days, but typically up to about 14. So this creates and, and helps us move into actually some of the um, uh, priorities that the calendar committee put together when they met recently. And it really was when we looked at in developing a model to support the, uh, the blended learning or the, actually the four different cohorts, cohort A, B, um, C, which is the 100% virtual model, and D, which is the first and second graders. They came away with three, um, three significant uh, uh, items that they really wanted to focus on. One is they wanted the cohorts A and B to have a balanced number of in-person days. Uh, that was definitely a priority. Um, they also wanted to have a predictable schedule. Um, so um, again, minimizing those number of breaks. 
um, for students and really focusing on Monday, Tuesday being cohort A in person and uh, Thursday, Friday being cohort B. Um, like to again remind people when you see this, you'll also note that there's this blue in the middle, which is 36 days of um, virtual learning for all students. Again, we, the model we, we um, you adopted called for learning every day. Um, we know that asynchronous learning does not, sometimes has more learning for students on some days than others because some work ahead, some have to catch up a bit. But each one of those days is a learning day for our students. And really the focus on this calendar for the green and the, and the yellow is the in-person days are equalized. The, um, the other, uh, and, and again, also again, that, that predictable schedule again in that maximization. So the PDIP days, instead of being on five days, is really on Wednesday mornings. Um, we have from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. every Wednesday, barring two uh, or one workday for elementary and one workday for secondary. Every, uh, every Wednesday from 8 to 10 is, profession, or is instructional planning, uh, collaboration, and from 10 to noon each Wednesday is professional development. So we actually have 35 opportunities in two hour chunks. It looks different. We've actually been able to increase the amount of time to support uh, the transition of our staff to this new model because it is very different than what they experienced last year. <clears throat> Finally, um, there are no snow makeup days in this model. Um, as I think back again to two years ago, the things that were keeping us from getting there to this, to this particular um, situation is we did not have the devices. Um, we now have devices for every student. The second thing is we did not have a platform for that work to take place, we build that platform for our learning management system, which is Seesaw for pre-K through grades two, and then three through 12, the use of Canvas. So this model does provide us some key items of note. So first, on Thursday, October 8th, uh, would be, is going to be a school day if approved. That was supposed to originally have been a uh, parent-teacher conference day and has now been moved into the week of Thanksgiving. The second piece is that Friday, October 9th, all schools would still remain closed. We felt it was too short a notice to, uh, for, to notify people, especially because a significant number of staff had already made plans. And then Monday, October 12th, which was planned to be a professional development instructional planning day, would also be an instructional day. So this really adds an in-person day to, to cohort B on the 8th of October and to cohort A on the 12th of October. And again, I'd like to reiterate one more time, these are learning days for all students. They just happen to be in-person days uh, for those students. The family conferences, as we mentioned, uh, do move to November with a full eight hours of conferences on Monday the 23rd. Um, and then the week before that, we have the evening conferences for elementary on Monday, the 16th of November, Tuesday for middle school and Thursday for high school. You do see that also there was a small shift in, the, um, in February, moving conferences from the uh, from February 25th down to March, uh, gotta make sure I got the right date, down to March 2nd. Um, that was to accommodate, um, because we know that extended day could then lead into a, um, a staff day, um, which is also a virtual learning day for students. Um, and then also the day off, which was February 26th, um, was shifted to November 24th. Um, and again, all of those shifts were made to try to accommodate those priorities of balanced cohorts, maximizing in-person days, and trying to make a predictable schedule for our, for our families. Uh, this model was reviewed by several people, including the Eau Claire Association of Educators. Um, the calendar committee did come together. Um, we used the feedback from families in the past to be able to provide, um, again, the min minimize the number of interruptions. So you'll notice again that there are not a lot of interruptions, although that when there are, um, they are extended. And then also, a question was raised about the hours and uh, regarding the Department of Public Instruction. So I'm going to read you the language, which uh, each of us could find also on the Department of Public Instruction website, that in a scenario for, um, for uh, blended or virtual learning, hours of instruction are based upon the time teachers are available to students. So there is sometimes the misconception that online learning is um, fully face-to-face -face with a camera. Um, it typically is uh, much more... Um, uh, distributed than that, um, rather than being a continuous on time with a camera. And it also includes that time available and the district's estimate of the amount of time needed to accomplish learning objectives each day. Now we know that there's a great deal of variability in that with students. And so we really used our instructional model calculations from the adopted calendar in this model as well. 
Finally, um, one item that had come up uh, that we were going to address um, after the calendar was originally adopted was the WI competition calendar because we knew that there was a conflict with the last calendar with some of the WI um, state regional uh, sectional competitions in the spring. Now that spring season for athletics has been moved to late June, that conflict does not exist. So uh, one advantage uh, that we do have in front of us is that, that the, the concern about graduation dates um, interfering with WI competitions is no longer an issue for us. With that, um, Can I just add a couple yep, points? Kay Marks does want to add one, one uh, a couple of points, go ahead. Thank you. Can you, Jim, can you go back to yeah. um, the, the current calendar? Yes. Thank you. So uh, Jim had talked about the fact that uh, with our current calendar, that this is the calendar that we would um, sort of back to if we were in a safer at home situation or if uh, the community was fortunate enough to get to phase F of the Eau Claire City County Health um, Plan. And so the only um, clarification I want to make there is that if we get to um, a safer at home um, order that would come from the state we would resort back to this calendar dependent upon how long that safer at home order may be. So for example, if, um, if we had to shut down uh, the district and be safer at home for a couple of weeks versus a couple of months, um, that time frame would make a difference uh, depending on which calendar we would go to for that time period. Um, and so, depending on the length of time for safer at home, that would be a determining factor in which calendar we would go to. Um, and then the second part about uh, phase F, the five days um, of in-person learning, uh, there was a lot of questions about that in the opening comments, the public comments uh, this evening. And um, I know that Superintendent Johnson will speak to that in his transition plan presentation. Um, later on this evening, but the work that's gone in is to prepare for something that we haven't already experienced. When we have the opportunity to go back to school five days a week, that's something that we've experienced forever uh, in the district. And so to resort back to, to the current adopted model that um, we're working in um, currently, prior to what we've been doing this year, um, we consider that to be the easy part because that's what students, staff, and families know. So that hasn't been the focus of um, the changes to the calendar because we already have a calendar that works, works for the community, works for the families. They've helped to develop that along with staff members for the past four to five to six years. So that piece, um, works for us as we know it. And when we have the opportunity to go back to school face-to-face -face five days a week, that would be the calendar that we would switch back to. Um, it wouldn't happen overnight. It would take some time to get to that in a transitional plan, um, but it would go back to that, uh, to our, our typical calendar that we all uh, experience on a regular basis. So Jim, those are my only two points. That's excellent. Thank you for the, for the uh, filling in those details. Those are important. So at this time, we'll take any questions that the board has. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate the focus on making changes to balance out our, our instruction and the work that you and your team continue to do uh, to help us be nimble at this time. Uh, comments and questions from board members, including our student representatives. Dr. I'm trying to consider the feedback that we received, especially from staff members. Um, with the calendar revisions, one issue that was brought to our attention was for secondary educators, uh, those that teach only semester long classes, it was the lack of preparation time between semesters. I, uh, has that I don't see that if that's been resolved or what consideration was given to that preparation time. So a class would be ending um, and then the very next uh, time back in school would be classes beginning. 
Right. So the um, so there, you're referring, I believe, to the January 20th date, correct? So originally the semester was going to end uh, the Friday before on the 15th. Uh, so the, the date was actually moved to the following Wednesday to ensure that the first semester and the second semester were as equalized as possible for our students. Um, the day of the 20th will be a work day. It will not be a professional development or instructional planning day. Staff will have that um, in between that. So typically when the, the semester ends on a Friday, um, the following Monday, one work day is spent for that. For um, both, it's provided for um, the record keeping and to prepare for the next semester. Um, there is still one work day, it just does not fall on a weekend. Or adjacent to a weekend, I should say. There are no other comments or questions. I would hear a motion to approve the proposed calendar. Uh, pr President um, uh, Nardine, I did neglect actually one statement in the presentation that I'd like to highlight that is actually on the calendar. Of course. Is, is that the, um, the conferences for family teacher conferences will be held virtually um, from our staff instead of in person. And that again is to mitigate the um, uh, potential transmission of, of COVID-19. So that was just something I, I left out of my comments. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, given, given that point, uh, could, could you uh, speak to, is the school district uh, prepared that uh, all parents are uh, adequately prepared to be able to hold uh, virtual conferences and that accessibility uh, needs will be addressed as, as it pertains to if it's uh, 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 issues as it relates to ESL and or accessibility issues for uh, 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 parents, individuals with disabilities. So can you give me an update uh, of where the school district is and being knowledgeable that that's going to be able to be a, a, a equitable access uh, to the parent teacher conference from a virtual standpoint? One of the advantages that we have is that um, if families come in through their student with their student through their student device, um, we know that every student has a device and every student that has requested um, a hotspot for um, internet, uh, internet access that they don't have it will have it as well. So they would come in the same way and that we are working on, um, we'll have to work on professional development with our staff on how to admit them into conferences to be able to schedule through Skyward and then use Microsoft Teams to allow people to admit so that there's not more than one adult in each conference. And we do have the structures in place to do that. They just simply have to do the training over the next month and a half to ensure that they have a smooth transition to make that happen. I, I guess still the follow-up question though is in terms of the, the accessibility piece. There's For some uh, individuals with disabilities, there may be additional uh, 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 technology that's needed to even access the uh, uh, approved uh, laptops or iPads that were sent out. And then also, can you just address uh, 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 the potential uh, communication language uh, interpretation needs that may uh, still may need to be there. And that'll be part of the outreach from our buildings as they work with families about what the accommodations are in place. And those take place with every parent teacher conference. Um, anytime that there's any sort of needs in terms of, it could be interpretation services or other um, special assistance for um, both adults and children. Um, that is something that takes place between um, the classroom and the building and the family, and that will continue. It will take a little bit more logistics than in the past because um, it's technological, but that is still something that um, typically happens with parent-teacher conferences and should continue in this model. Commissioner, is there? Jim, can you talk about a little bit more about the, the snow days switching to virtual? How prepared, I mean, so I'm just thinking about a student who's normally in person um, Thursday and Friday, uh, and then the, the the students that are normally in their virtual component Thursday and Friday. Uh, what will be the student who is in person? How easy would will, will that switch to a virtual day be um, with with rosters the way that they are and the, and the way that things are structured? Can you talk about how? I'm just wondering if we want to have any optional 
um, weather makeup days in there in case the, the instruction, it, the virtual instruction is not possible or easy or accessible the way that we think it might be? Or could you just speak more to that? Yeah, you bet. So, and actually, um, our greatest challenge right now is at the early learning level, trying to make sure that those devices actually are able to go home. So it actually is it's getting our families and students in the routine of the device going home so that whether it's snow or whether it's um, a closure due to um, disease spread, um, we need to, and we're not there yet because those habits have not been developed all the way through the system. Um, so it's, so there's the technological piece about just making sure that they have the device with them and are able to transport that back and forth on a regular basis and make that part of their routine. Um, that's not quite in place yet, so we've got a little bit of time to get there. And, we're, we're um, hoping that we do not have a disease closure um, before we get that habit fully developed. And then also it's um, inform informing our staff to make sure that they're aware to always have plans ready for, because again, if we, if we go back to, um, we have a learning plan for um, each day of the week. And so being nimble enough to be able to ship that to an online format rather than an in-person format um, is gonna be um, part of a challenge for our staff, but. Given enough notice, we feel that we can pull that off. Um, but again, it's that would allow for us to have that continuity of learning rather than on the disruption and extension of the school year for an indeterminate number of days, depending on what Mother Nature brings. I think. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you asked that because one of the things that's on my to do list after today's board meeting is um, to work with principals to develop expectations for what that would look like and then um, help them roll those expectations out to staff. And um, I was actually thinking about that this weekend with October here, um, the possibility of a snow day isn't far away. Mm -hmm. So it popped up on my to-do list, um, you know, near the top. Um, and I, we just need to wait to see, um, you know, if, it, if it's needed um, based on the approval of the calendar or not. So just to clarify as a follow-up, so, if, if I'm understanding secondary correct, and it's still very, um, I'm still struggling with exactly how it looks in the hybrid model. My understanding is the students at the secondary level, particularly in high school, are getting core content in person. And those teachers, you feel confident that at the secondary level in high school, that those teachers will be ready to switch that long block scheduling to some sort of synchronous, asynchronous, model on uh, with with an hour's notice in the morning and and their students will be able to link into those core content classes within I mean sometimes students families don't know until 6 30 7 o'clock in the morning that we're calling a snow day and you're confident that that kiddo at 7 30 is going to be able to get into their core content class whether it's math language whatever on that day and we don't need to plan for like oh well that didn't work we should have a day on the calendar where I'm just, I'm just trying to make sure that if we're actually going to approve this without any snow days, if we, I just don't want us to get in a sticky spot where you realize it didn't, it's not going to work the way we thought it would. Should we just have some days in there just in case? And so I think that's what goes back to what Kim was saying about developing those expectations and planning. And typically, you know that a snow event is coming. It's just a matter of is it, is it significant enough to cause a closure? We also know that there are events that take place that give little notice, such as freezing rain or, some, or others. And really it's gonna be a shift in expectations and culture in the district to be able to have people be ready and like you said, be that nimble. But also our staff, um, whether you are a 100% virtual teacher or you're a blended teacher, you are already in the online environment creating asynchronous and synchronous material. And so that is not new to our staff, um, but it will be a shift, but it does allow for some predictability in all ends that every day uh, will be a learning day. And again, when we um, move to the, uh, if we do have a closure day due to weather, inclement weather, um, the expectation, again, um, virtual learning is not um, a full seven hours in front of a camera, just, just at a distance. It is typically more asynchronous, and, um, but we still can have opportunities for synchronous as well. And staff with enough notice, um, we feel it will be, and again, as Kim was saying, develop the expectations uh, with the principals and uh, with enough notice for people. It's a shift, this will be the first time and, and we're, we've never been in a position to be able to do this, and we are there now. And all the feedback we have with the calendar committee is um, this was not an item that seemed to be a, an issue for that. As, um, I think, Kay, I don't know if it was brought to your attention or through any other feedback, but it really was. It did not seem to be a concern from the groups that, that we worked with. Uh, 
Dr. Johnson. Yeah, could, as, 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 as we're having this, uh, this discussion about what potentially will take place if we, if on all virtual days, could, uh, could I get skip, uh, some in, uh, input or information? Uh, what, what's the current procedures or protocols as it relates to uh, uh, disruption in internet access? What happens on those particular days for uh, for students and families, and then what potentially happens for uh, uh, for for teachers and their delivery if there's disruption to, uh, technology and or internet access issues? Uh, you know, if we, we if, if we imagine depending on uh, uh, the weather uh, and, and, and the temperatures, uh, my internet uh, my internet at my home uh, did not actually work during the. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Polar vortex or whatever we experienced, uh, which would probably make sense that nothing would work with negative 50, 50 degree uh, wind chill. But what what what's what's our protocol or procedures now if if it's indicated either teacher and our students or families have inter, internet disruption? Uh, uh, and in terms of because I think back to the uh, to our student representative comments, I believe uh, 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 the student Wolf. Uh, when she was talking about the different expectations of a, uh, synchronous and asynchronous, whether or not you you do the work uh, at that same time, counted as absence or not, do we do we have protocols and procedures in place for uh, internet technology disruption access? Uh, access? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that that internet disruption i would as an instructor would not be any different than any other disruption the student and typically our, fam, our our staff are aware of that and accommodate students if they're not able to get in when they expected them to be in um, that's one of the beauties of virtual learning is it does that asynchronous um, model does allow for flexibility um, because sometimes there are disruptions not just for the internet but also there might be a family disruption um, and so there are a variety of different things that can interrupt um, so, so that that being uh, that's in other words. So in other words, we just accommodate just just like we would in any other situation, whether it's technology based or not. Um, one thing we also did learn through our hotspots recently is that um, our the Verizon system was actually um, under resourced to match the demand for the hotspots we delivered, and um, fortunately, Verizon has accommodated that. So we feel that the baseline that we're working with is much stronger. Than it was at the start of the year um, because the vendor um, has made some adjustments to support all students um, that are receiving that service in a more um, robust manner. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, I, I'm not sure which one of you to ask, but um, I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, other entities in the community that might be affected by calendar changes and what efforts were made to reach out to them whether those are resource centers for families who may have been seeking uh, services on days when schools were closed um, and what the communication with those entities are, are like, because I just don't want to spring anything on anybody. Um, and similarly with student transit, what type of communication was done with them and their staff to, to make sure that they were on board with, with any changes that we made to the calendar. Um, if you could just speak a little bit to the to the community outreach um, portion of of what was done uh, prior to bringing this to us. Commissioner Zur, I, I I had probably, and I don't know the procedure path procedure for a calendar committee um, outreach to others. Um, what I can say is I did connect with the YMCA regarding this late change. Um, and I'm not I'm not aware of other child care centers. Kim, do you have other? Um, I, I don't know of other child care centers, but um, we did discuss this at system leaders. Um, student transit is part of that discussion. We also discussed it with ECAE, um, which is um, the Teachers Association. Um, they were part of the discussion as well. I'll take this moment to just go back a little ways in the discussion. I just want to echo 
Dr. Johnson's comments about uh, ESL and accommodations for people with disabilities. Uh, I've seen several organizations now struggling with how to move people around from room to room in a multiple you know, room situation in a virtual meeting. I know it can be a struggle and I'm, I'm confident, uh, Jim, from what you're talking about, that you are gonna do this work to develop that, especially for our ESL translators. Uh, and again, the disability, but uh, we do have some extra time in that we're moving the conferences back to November now. And I hope that a good chunk of that is focused on making sure that that can be uh, accomplished efficiently. I know I've seen you know, practice sessions of people moving back and forth where they're needed so that we can do that without a lot of hiccups. Uh, you know, those are one of our uh, often most difficult populations to serve, uh, especially in this needed communication. So I know that was a few minutes ago, but I didn't want to let that pass without throwing my support behind it as well. Yeah, noted, thank you. Other comments and questions? Otherwise, I would hear a motion to approve the proposed calendar. I'll motion to approve the calendar. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Seconded, uh, moved and seconded. All those in favor of approval of the proposed calendar, please say aye. 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 Those, aye. Those, those abstaining. Thank you, the motion passes. Thank you for the work that you've done in bringing us these changes. Our next item on the agenda is the preliminary budget report and adoption. Abby Johnson. All right, thank you everyone. Um, tonight, our goal is to have a preliminary budget adoption um, in advance of our final budget adoption, which is October 26th. And um, I'll outline some of the changes and some of the things that we're expecting to change between now and then. Um, so first of all, um, our preliminary 2021 revenues by fund as of last week are an operating budget of just over 147 million. Our debt service funds of 3.1 for fund 38, 3.4 for fund 39, our food service fund of 2.7 million, our employee benefit trust fund about 8.5, and our community service fund of 827,000. That gives us total revenues of 165.9 million. Because I know that that's a lot of numbers, um, I thought it was important to show a graph of how does that break down in all of our revenues. So you can see that fund 10, our general fund, is 83.31% of our budget. And that's because that's the bulk of where our operating and operating expenses occur. Um, if you remember, um, our operating funds are the general fund, the special education fund, and our other project service funds. So when you add those three together, uh, that becomes about um, 90 or about 85% of our total budget for the revenues. We want to talk about the preliminary expenses by fund. You can see our current operating budget is just over 148 million. Our debt service is at 3.1 and 3.5 million. Our food service is 3.4 million. Our employee benefit trust is 7.9, and the community service fund is 827. All in all, that leaves our total expenses as of October 1st at about 166.8 million dollars. Again, when we look at the pictures and break it down. You're going to see that most of those expenditures are coming in the operating funds, which is fund 10, 27, and 29. We've been talking a lot about fund balance um, over the last couple of years because um, we've yeah. had some concerns in our fund balance. And so you may have heard in budget development, we talked about this last week, that our dif difference between operating revenues and operating expenses last year was just over $7.7 .7 million that gave our fund balance a boost to 26.9% of our fund 10 expenditures. You'll remember our auditors like to see this number between 25 and 32%. This is the first time um, in the, since 2014 that we have hit that target. And I think it was even several years before 2014 that we were in that range. We have a lot of items to finalize this year. And a lot of it's just doing 
related to the fact of our hybrid model. So at this time of year, we're not usually working through staffing adjustments, but because of the virtual component and also um, requests to move students between virtual and blended, um, we've had to make some staffing adjustments and those are still being finalized. We expect them to be finalized at the end of this week. When we talk about overloads, um, again, overloads are usually defined by this time of year, but we're still working through those, um, again, due to the different models that of instruction that's occurring. Our increments are being evaluated as what can we do for students and what activities can we hold to be socially distanced and be safe for our students. Our substitutes, um, again, that was mentioned earlier about how many substitutes do we have and what are we going to need? And so we're finalizing the budget with that as well right now. Uh, we talked a bit about our transportation contract at budget development last week. And so that's a piece that we need to finalize as well. And it's really more about what do we do for these long-term closures? Um, we can talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. The CARES funding, um, you know that we received about $1.5 million from, for CARES funding, and we're finalizing how do we plan to use that. We actually have until September of 2022 to spend those funds, but we might have a more urgent need and we want to use that now. So that will be finalized when you adopt the final budget on October 26th. Our technology leases, we have just received all of the um, laptops in the last couple of weeks. And so we're waiting on that final paperwork so we can reflect that actual piece in our um, budget. Food service is still being finalized. I'm sure you're all aware that our food service program is very different than what it's been in the past. We currently know that the USDA has given funding for free meals until December 31st or until the funds run out. That has an impact on our food and nutrition budget. It's normally operated like a standalone business, but due to some of those changes, um, we need some. We need to review and analyze some of that. We're currently projecting a loss in food service, which is not typically what we would do. So we would just start double checking those numbers to make sure that everything is right and analyzing how does September look compared to what we were thinking the year will look like. And then also athletic fees. Um, we do have a discussion on the table tonight for you about the athletic fees, and we had that. We started that discussion at budget development last week. Continuing on with the athletic fees, what do we? What does the school board want to do about the fees for 2021? I currently do not have any athletic fees included in the revenue budget. Historically, that's about been about two hundred and sixty thousand dollars. We know that the seasons are going to be shorter and that they're alternate. And if a season is canceled, there won't be any fees collected. So one of the questions that I have for you is, what do you want the budget for athletic fees to be? And do you have a recommendation of what that should look like for these shortened alternate seasons for 2021? When we talk about our tax levy comparison and what is that gonna look like, you can see that our fund 10 general fund levy is about $2.6 million less than what it was last year at this time. If you remember in many, many of my budget presentations, when our um, tax levy goes down, that means our state aid is going up. And so that's the biggest difference in our general fund tax levy is that if we have a state aid increase this year, that's offsetting that reduced tax levy. When we look at fund 38 and 39, you can see that's almost about a million dollars between those two funds. Um, we've been talking about a debt drop in the 2021 year. And um, so that is reflected that we paid off some debt in the 1920 school year. And so the levy is, is less in those two funds for this year. And then in fund 80, you can also see a reduced levy there. Our community service fund is our middle school activities. It's our special Olympics. It's our um, school resource officers and things that are beneficial to our whole community and not just the Eau Claire school district. What we know so far is that the fall um, activities for middle schools have been canceled and that's driving the majority of that difference in that tax levy. And these numbers are preliminary and there's a lot of information that comes out on October 15th that these will change. And so thinking about what happens on October 15th, our third Friday student count is finalized and approved by DPI. We get our final state aid number for our revenue limit. We also get our computer aid number finalized on October 15th. All of that information helps us finalize the tax levy that we just showed you. Transportation expense is also tied to our revenue limit increase. That's been part of our contract for a very long time. 
And our open enrollment numbers are also finalized when we get the certification on October 15th. We know that our open enrollment numbers are very different than they've been in the past. Our preliminary estimates show we have 200 more students open enrolled out this year than what we've had in the past. Um, when Mike and I talked last week with the um, DPI uh, state superintendent, they're seeing uh, many districts in the same situation. Many more students going out, private school enrollments are up. And so we're anxious to see what does that look like for the Eau Claire School District on October 15th. So next step for tonight would be, uh, does the board wanna have any discussion or a decision on athletic fees of what to put into the budget? And then the final step tonight would be to adopt the preliminary budget as I presented to you tonight. And with that, what questions can I answer for you? Thank you, Abby. Questions from board members? Commissioner Lyons? So Abby, you said that uh, there would be no fees collected um, if uh, the season was canceled. Uh, for partial seasons, is there a plan to um, have a partial fee? Yeah, that was part of what we discussed at budget development last week, and we're hoping that the board would um, want to have that conversation. We would recommend that we look at a reduced fee schedule, knowing that the seasons are shorter and have that potential of, um, you know, part of the season or maybe doing some different things if there's a quarantine or an outbreak. Um, so one of the things that we talked about administratively was should we uh, ask the board to review a 50% reduction in the fee structure for the 2021 year. Now keep in mind that we do have in place for students that qualify for free or reduced, um, you know, already a method for them to assist with athletic fees. And each high school does have a um, donor that is willing to provide scholarships to um, eliminate fees if they're outside of that ability to um, qualify for free and reduced, and also to help with other athletic costs as well. So right now you don't have fees built in at all. What would be the impact of just saying this year there would be no athletic fees at all, as opposed to a 50% reduction? Um, you are correct. I do not have any athletic fees in there at all this year. And so um, last year, uh, due to the cancellation of spring sports and the, the refunds we issued, it was about $200,000. Um, previous to that, it's usually running about $260,000. So if you base it on, on two years ago, um, I would say 50% would be probably around $130,000. If you base it on last year, then there would, you know, it would be the what I've got it projected right now because there's nothing included. Sure, the, the math is actually trivial, right? I mean, we can all divide 260 by two. And, and no, that's, but I'm talking about the, the overall impact for our district. You know, there has been discussion from time to time about wanting to eliminate athletic fees uh, or, you know, in general, in order to provide more equity for students. I realize that we have the free and reduce, but you have to have applied for free and reduced and asked for it at that point. So I guess, uh, and maybe Abby, you don't need to, to answer this question, maybe it's a part of the board discussion. Um, you know, what would it look like if we just said for this year, let's not run fees? Commissioner Lyons? And a, a slight follow up to what uh, President Norton is saying in that uh, are there other areas within the budget that you are seeing uh, savings? that might be able to uh, accommodate. So what's the impact on the budget if, if in fact, uh, the fees are waived? Well, in the proposed budget that you're gonna to adopt tonight, the uh, deficit is currently at about $760,000. Um, because of all the items that we have to finalize and the information needed on October 15th, um, it could be higher than that, it could be lower than that. Um, so without it in there right now, just with where we're at, we're at a $760,000 deficit. So, um, you know, obviously if there were some fees that would reduce it, if there's no fees, that's what you're sitting at today. Mr. 
Commissioner, is there? Um, Abby, Dr. Johnson. Oh, I'm sorry, I probably missed it. Will you say again the what you're seeing in food service? You said normally it runs. A, I have two questions, really. So that what is the normal revenue off of food service versus what you're expecting this year, um, and what that contrib what's that contrib what is that contributing to the deficit? And do you see that changing at some point, or do you foresee our current food service system lasting? for the course of the year or do you see if we went back to five days uh food service would would change and what is the potential revenue uh from that and i guess the second piece is um being new to the board i don't actually really know what this what this budget kind of like when is the next time we hear from you what are we asked to do at that point um it's a preliminary budget, it's not a final budget. So could you just give me like a rundown of what your calendar looks like for when you come in front of the board normally? Sure. Um, so let's talk about food service first. So food service stands alone. And so none of the $760,000 deficit is related to food and nutrition. Um, part of the, um, the state statutes said that food service needs to kind of be treated like a business. It kind of needs to operate on its own and be able to cover its costs. And so um, the budget that you're asking to be approved tonight um, for food service is showing a deficit. Um, and a lot of that is due to some of the food service being down right now and then just figuring out this new model of being able to provide and um, how does that impact financially the um, USDA, you know, supporting all of the Food for our students. So we just have a little bit more work to do because um, the numbers and where we think we're going to land is very different. Now, if we go back to five, five days, you know, after the USDA funding runs out, will that have a different impact on that budget? Yes, um, because you'd have half of the year providing meals one way and then half of the year providing meals another way. So those are some of the things that we're just reevaluating and looking at as well. And then we wanted to we're finalizing the September numbers to help give us a better idea and projection of what, um, you know, what does that look like through December 31st. So, um, so that is kind of a standalone and normally we would adopt um, a balanced budget in fund 50, we wouldn't have a deficit. Um, like we are proposing tonight. And then really the next steps. Um, so usually in October. Uh, the first meeting in October, the board would adopt a preliminary budget um, that's required by state statute because we have to publish in the newspaper 15 days in advance of the formal budget adoption. And so um, it used to always go in the Sunday paper, but since the leader telegram doesn't have a Sunday paper any longer, that will actually be in Friday's paper. Um, and then that way, then it lets our community know, here's the budget that we're planning to adopt on October 26th, and we've met the statutory requirement of the 15 days for that public notice. Um, sometimes we would come back to the board um, before the official budget adoption um, if there was some questions or concerns because basically October 15th gives us the final information that we need from DPI in order to finish the budget. So when I talked about the reconciliation in October of 2020, all of these items aren't finalized until we get our state uh, certification from DPI, and that happens on October 15th. So then what happens is from October 15th through the budget adoption time, we're getting everything updated, the budget binder is ready uh, for publication, and then we send that out. And then on October 26th, the board will formally adopt the budget for the 2021 school year. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, just uh, uh, just three questions. So, assuming uh, if I heard you correctly, Abby, so we will be getting an additional, we will be getting additional state aid despite uh, the budget cuts that uh, are expected uh, uh, statewide. We are going to receive a uh, an increase in state aid. Is that what I heard correctly? You did hear that correctly. So um, Dr. Johnson, how that works is on July 1st, they give us a preliminary aid estimate. And so with that preliminary aid estimate, there was $179 more per people in our revenue limit. And there was a lot of discussion this fall 
about a budget repair bill and about the fact that maybe they were going to reduce those dollars that were coming to us. And so um, as recently as last week, when we sat and listened to BPI, they do not anticipate any reductions to the October 15th um, certification because it would have already had to have been done. It would have had to have been legislated. What they did tell us to be cautious and aware of is that for 21, 22, 22, 23, the next biennium budget, that there could be some significant cuts and changes to how business is done and what our aid looks like going forward. But at this point, it's too late for them legislatively to change something for this October 15th. They did talk a little bit about the only opportunity to change anything would come in the per people categorical aid and that payment comes to the school district in March. Um, again, the law says here's how much it's supposed to be. Um, and that would be very challenging if they came back after this budget is adopted and said, hey, we're going to change your per people aid. Um, I Again, I'm not real confident that they will do that, but that's that's the only piece that they had said that there could be an opportunity to make a change. And I think that if they did that, we'd all be in, a, we'd all be in um, shock and it would cause some bigger, bigger problems because that per people aid is about $8 million for, for us based upon our student count. Thank you. And then the, the other two questions are just re, uh, related to potential estimated costs. So what's the estimated uh, uh, monetary loss of the plus 200 students uh, leaving the Eau Claire area school district and then do we have cost estimates right now we're using federal funds to accommodate the meal plan I thought I also heard that is it the school district's uh plan to even after the uh, aid runs out in December that we will continue this into the spring and so I'm just wondering if you could provide an estimated cost for the continuation after that after that aid happens are, are we not going to continue uh, providing the meals? Yeah, so let me talk to you about the food and nutrition one first. So if I said something that made you believe that the school district was going to continue to pro provide free meals after the, the USDA funding runs out, that was inaccurate. Um, the food service needs to operate like a business. And so if we're not guaranteed revenue from the USDA or um, the feds, we would need to go back to our old model of charging for the meals because again that's a standalone program and it needs to operate independently and um so i mean what we're going to be evaluating right now is how did the month of september look what was our reimbursements compared to what were our costs and did we project accurately what those are going to look like for the rest of the year and what we think um the open enrollment question we are anticipating that it's going to be about $1.6 million. Um, that would be additional funds going to other school districts. Um, and we'll have that final information on October 15th when everything is certified to us. Thank you. You're welcome. She's a I see you. I'm just waiting to see if anybody else wants to jump in before we go back. <laughs> Right, it's just a quick follow-up to to the question about open enrollment is that is that how much our enrollment is down or how many is that where our enrollment drop is is it just 200 students or what we would typically see is that or are there additional enrollment drops whether that's just not necessarily open enrollment but uh, homeschooling or or any sort of additional leaving the district drops. I'm going, this is Kim. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the opening of schools report. I'll share some enrollment data, including um, what our numbers looked like on third Friday last year compared to this year. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Clements. Uh, I believe earlier, President Nardine, you were looking for uh, insight into the budget fees. And uh, I would support the option of potentially not collecting it, but I thought it case this year if that uh, means potentially improving equity of access to those programs, given everything that 
students are having to deal with this year. Yeah, I certainly think it makes sense given you know, the economic uncertainty of families that maybe in a normal year would have no problem with paying the full fee for an athletic activity or, an, or a non-athletic activity for that matter. But this year, because of the economy being the way it is with the pandemic, um, I think that, that makes some good sense. So um, we can, of course, ask more questions as we have them. We do have two asks that the administration has made of us tonight. One is to discuss uh, where we'd like to go with these athletic fees in this proposed budget, and then to adopt the preliminary budget uh, so that we can be in compliance with the law and prepare for our October 26th budget adoption hearing. So uh, if we could maybe turn to, I guess, first athletic fees discussion, um, and then we can go forward from there. Commissioner Harder, uh, sorry, Commissioner uh, Harder, I want to make it known. I see that Emory Tool is also unmuted, so I'll go to him after you. I apologize for interrupting. No problem. Uh, yeah, uh, just briefly on the athletic fees, we have discussed that in previously in budget development prior to the pandemic, um, and. Uh, Talked about some of the unique circumstances of Eau Claire. I think a Abby, you uh, and and te your team worked on a, a bit of a survey of the Big Rivers Conference and looking at some of the not just the fees, not only the fees, but also the uh, estimated expenses to the district um, to provide services. And I think that was I think that's kind of where we left it before the. Um, pandemic hit uh in obviously we're in a quite a different situation now um but I, I would like to distinguish this conversation about how to deal with this very unusual year uh from the larger discussion of athletic fees um in general and how to deal with them in a more normal year um abby would you could you speak to that at all sure i don't have all of the information um Locked in my brain, but yes, we did have a big discussion about it at budget development probably about two years ago. And when we looked at what um, what were the fees we were collecting compared to other big river schools, and then what were the expenses. And um, obviously, the big expenses are really related to salary and fringe for your coaches, and then transportation is going to be your next highest expense. And I think um, when we compared, I think that. Um, you know, we were higher than what some of the others, but I think our costs were also higher. And so I think that's kind of where the discussion ended. Um, I think it may still be on our work list of items to look at, but I think for the time being, it was kind of put on hold because um, again, we were um, proposing an adopted budget with a deficit. And then, you know, when we're running 250, 260,000, it's, you know, quarter of a million dollars and where do we come up with that? And so, um, I think that's why the conversation kind of was put on hold and it's on our list to continue to evaluate. And so they just came to the forefront now due to the pandemic and where we're at. Yeah, thank you. And would you agree that this is kind of a, they're really sort of our two different, they're related but different conversations, uh, what, what we're dealing with this year versus what we would be dealing with in a normal year? Correct, I would agree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, we'll go to Emory Tool. Okay, so I'm curious, kind of in the same vein of athletic and activities fees, if in general or this year specifically, we've looked at all at absorbing AP fees instead of charging them to our students, kind of in that same vein of like equity and making it accessible to all of our students. I can tell you that I have not been part of any conversations related to AP test fees at this point in time. Um, I don't know if that's something that we have the flexibility to do um, because that's it's from um, AP that dictates that fee in collection. Um, right, they have, a fee, they have a fee schedule and they also have a free reduce. So as a district, um, you know, we've tried piloting before, um, uh, waiving fees for areas that we had, um, we wanted to test out. For example, we did that for a real small group of students for world languages in the past. Um, but it would have to be a district initiative. That's a pretty big, be, I mean, that would be a significant expenditure of the district to waive AP fees. That'd be something the board would have to consider as a separate item. All right, thank you. Yeah. 
does ahead. bring it does bring up an interesting point. Just to add to the discussion about it, it does bring up an interesting point. Um, I get, can we can we discuss without a motion? Can I discuss? Is that, is that okay. Um, so it does bring up an interesting point about equity and access. And if we're going to eliminate fees for one um, section of our of our extracurriculars and what, what will we do for the rest? So it does, you know, if we're going to do this for athletics, um, you know, do we, will we need to consider doing it for other things? I just think it's, it's an interesting question. I appreciate that thought. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about athletic fees, is it really just athletics or is it athletics and any other activities that may have a fee but are not sports? Yes, um, when we were discussing it um, last week, we talked specifically about athletic fees because those are the volume that we hear about. But I would think that we could do the same thing with the activities fees. So if I'm a student that participates in a drama, there's like five, five extracurricular activities at the two high schools. Um, and we could, we could talk about those as well. I did not put any fees related to that into the budget that's currently in front of you. I do have fees for AP tests included because that is, um, you know, not related to um, an athletic or a participation fee type of a thing. And so um, if that's something that, you know, there you want more discussion on, I need to do some research and work with our um, TNL department because I don't know if that's something that, um, I don't know how that would work. I do know for AP fees, if I'm a student that qualifies for free or reduced, I don't pay anything for that AP test, and the district has to pay a certain fee to AP for that. That certainly seems like an additional discussion that we'd have to take up at a different time. Um, so, so there are no currently there are no fees for athletics or activities in the budget, right? Is that what I have just heard you say? Um, in Fund 10, for sure, there's nothing in there. Now, Fund 80, which is our middle school community piece, there may, there may be some fees in there. I don't have that right in front of me, so I would have to just confirm Fund 80. Um, but for, I can speak for certain in Fund 10, there's nothing there. And that 260, that 200 we've been talking about is solely Fund 10. It's outside of our Fund 80 um, middle school athletic um, fees that we would collect for. <coughs> Sure. So if we were just to approve the budget as preliminarily presented tonight, that would basically be the elimination of those fees that we're talking about. In fund 10. Yes, in fund 10. Correct. So would middle school still have fees then and high school would not? Um, like I said, off the top of my head, I don't know if it's included in Fund 80 or not, but that if it, if I if that was posted in Fund 80, we could certainly take it out as long as the motion was clear that it's across the board. I spent a lot more time on Fund 10, 27, and 29 than I have on Fund 80, so I just don't um, don't know for sure where we landed with the um, co-curricular piece in um, Fund 80. Sure. So at this point, I guess I'm looking for any additional discussion or for someone to make a motion. Uh, potential motions might be eliminating all funds across fund 10 and fund, or all funds, all uh, fees across fund 10 and fund 80, uh, or approval of the budget as presented, which would eliminate fees in fund 10, or a motion on a percentage reduction in the fees uh, that we would follow then by an approval of that budget. Also take a to reflect. No, go ahead, Commissioner Harder. I'm sorry, I didn't see you on mute. No problem. I would move to uh, to uh, approve the the budget as presented. I will second. And discussion on the motion. So, to, to, 
Let's go ahead. Yeah. The, to clarify that that does or does not include um, changes to fees as currently moved. Uh, my understanding, and Abby jumped in, that approval of the budget as Commissioner Harder has uh, moved, Mr. Lyons seconded, that would remove high school fees from Fund 10, but any middle school fees that were planned for in Fund 80 um, would still be in place. Is that, that's my understanding, is that correct on your understanding, Abby? Yes, that is my understanding, Commissioner Nordin. I guess I'll say I'm not certain why we would eliminate high school fees and not do the same at middle school for this particular year. But I, uh, Commissioner Harder, I'd like to hear your rationale for to that. You know, I uh, I actually had a different understanding of this budget, so I'm uh, I I thought it was we were talking about half of the fees being eliminated for the in, in this what was presented here. So I'm afraid I I maybe have a misunderstanding. Okay, would you like to retract your motion standing and then we can restart uh, well let, yeah well I'll, I'll be glad to retract it and why don't we confirm just what is presented here exactly is is it the is the high school but not the middle school or is it cut in half or sure just uh commissioner Lyons, is the retraction of the motion okay with you at this time it is okay yeah so yeah I'll, I'll, I'll recognize you in a second, Dr. Jones. Abby, if you could just break down what the current presented uh, budget, what fees are and are not included, just one more time for the record. Sure. One more time for the record. Fund 10 does not currently have any participation fees included in the budget um, because we were going to have this discussion tonight about what, what would the board like to see. Um, we focused on Fund 10. Um, because we were highly talking about the operating funds. In Fund 80, I cannot say for certain if we had included in the Fund 80 revenue budget fees or not. If they're included, they are reduced from what they were based upon the cancellation of false sports. Um, but without, with all, all of my records and needing to do a bunch of lookup work right here, I can't say for sure if there's participation fees in Fund 80 or not, without looking at um, my budget reports. Dr. Johnson, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I, I guess I would, I, I, I could I could restate the motion and, I, and, and I'm fine given that this is just a, a preliminary budget approval, given the fact that we will uh, uh, see this again in two weeks. And I guess in the two weeks I would request uh, uh, if, if Abby, if you two weeks give you enough time to uh, uh, tease out what those middle school appropriations are within uh, within Fund 80, uh, but I would I would re, re uh, uh, the motion to uh, uh, accept the budget as presented, knowing that uh, 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 Fund 10 does not include any at this particular time athletic funding in it. And also with the uncertainty of what the contributions are in, in, in the eighty, so I would, I would uh, uh, represent the motion uh, as as it was presented. So Dr. Johnson has moved to accept the budget as presented. Is there a second? Second. Once again, discussion on the motion. Seeing none, I'll call the question. Let's do a roll call vote. Commissioner Clements? Aye. Commissioner Harder? Aye. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Nordine? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Zur? Yes. Commissioner Bika? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Abby. And we'll look forward to hearing about those other fees on October 26th, if not earlier. I will now adjourn to committee. We have two items tonight. The first one uh, will likely be shorter than the second one. Uh, the first is the discussion and possible first reading of proposed policy 860 visitors to schools. Uh, that motion is up on uh, that motion. That policy is up on the screen. Uh, policy and governance has worked on this uh, for the last two meetings. Uh, 
Uh, Superintendent Johnson brought this to us in that we don't have a visitor's policy currently at this time. Uh, this policy is almost word for word the recommended language from the Wisconsin Association of School Boards. We made one minor change, um, we took that in, et cetera, and used including but not limited to, try to be somewhat clear. Um, other than that, um, we did not have any changes or substantive discussion. Um, I'll open it for discussion, otherwise we can do a first reading and then presumably be included in the consent agenda next time. Uh, if I could then have a volunteer to read the policy for us. Commissioner Lyons. Many individuals may want to enter the school buildings during the school day for a variety of reasons. The district, however, has a responsibility to protect the safety of students, staff, and others while they are in school buildings and to be, make sure the educational process is not disrupted. Since the building principal is responsible for helping ensure the safety of all persons in the school and for maintaining a school environment conducive to learning, all visitors are expected to report to the school office for a visitor's pass before going anywhere in the building during the school day. Determination or disposition of an individual's request to visit the school will be made by the building principal in his or her designee in accordance with administrative procedures currently in force. The building principal may designate exceptions to the requirement that visitors report and register in the school office in connection with a school performance, assembly, or similar event that is open to members of the public that occurs during the school day. Other exceptions may also be authorized by the superintendent. For purposes of this policy and its implementing procedures, any person other than a district student and or district employee who is present on school premises is regarded as a visitor. Visitors may include, but are not limited to, parents, guardians of students, school board members, school volunteers, invited speakers, vendors, representatives of the school of the news media, students not enrolled in or attending courses in the Eau Claire Area School District and interested citizens. State law specifically prohibits registered sex offenders from being on public school premises unless they have provided the required prior notification to school officials or fall under one of the exceptions provided by law. It is the responsibility of the registered sex offender to provide the required school notification. After receiving the required prior notification, the building principal shall determine whether the registered sex offender will be allowed to present on school premises for the proposed purpose or event and determine any conditions that may be placed on such permission for the safety of other persons present in the school environment. Regardless of the time of day, the superintendent or any building principal or his or her designee has a discretionary authority to exclude from the school premises any person who the district determines has no legitimate and approved purpose for being on school grounds, disrupts or appears likely to become a disruption to the educational program, or threatens the health or safety of students staff or others in the school. Any such individual will be directed to leave the school premises immediately and law enforcement authorities may be called if necessary. Due to the current COVID-19 health emergency, all visitors to the ECASD shall be required to wear a mask or face covering while present in any school building, facility, or other district controlled area. Visitors may be exempted from wearing masks and face coverings due to a documented medical condition. Face covering means a piece of cloth, e.g. cotton, linen, etc., or other similar material that is worn to cover the face and mouth completely. 
Examples of accepted face coverings include a cloth face mask, a disposable or paper mask, or a religious face covering. Face covering does not include face shields, neck gaiters, bandanas, mesh masks, masks with holes or openings, or masks with vents. Board member visits. Board members are required to visit the school. Individual board members are required to arrange visits with the school in advance by contacting the superintendent and building principal. Except in situations where one, the board has specifically approved or directed the visit, or two, the board member is visiting the school in his or her capacity as a parent of a student in the school, which in, which, in which case the request will be treated in the same manner as other parent requests. Visits by board members shall be regarded as informal expressions of interest in the schools visited and not as inspections of visits for supervisory purposes. If an individual board member and the administration are unable to address a request for a school visit to their mutual satisfaction, the individual board member may ask the board to evaluate his or her request. Thank you, Commissioner Lyons. We'll be sure to provide you with a lozenge. <laughs> uh, comments or questions? All right, then we will move this to the consent agenda for the October 19th meeting. The last item on the agenda tonight is the opening of schools, equity, transition plan, and summer school update. Superintendent Johnson. I am actually going to um, start the presentation, and uh, Superintendent Johnson is going to uh, conclude it. So I'll get started on. Uh, I'll get started on our opening schools report. So tonight we're providing an update to you regarding how our schools have opened over the last month. Um, September is a significant month uh, to us. Our staff and students return in full, and the third and the count of students on the third uh, Friday of the month uh, drives funding, which supports those students as they uh, work with us. And so, as we uh, discussed in the past. Um, as we reflect on that opening of schools, and we've discussed our, that equity is our foundation, or sometimes we've even said it's the plate of which everything resides on. Um, this has been a challenge with so many changes to the school year to focus on equity. Through these changes, we've continued to move this work forward through the leadership of our equitable multi level system of supports positions to reach each child. We look at what leveled support systems look like and how equity is embedded into these systems. And this includes several steps for us at this time. We've begun our pop-up professional development sessions. Uh, roughly 40 staff attended last week in our session, Speak Up, a guide to addressing racial trauma. We know that our communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID pandemic. And those, and as those students re-entered our, our physical and virtual classrooms, we need to understand that trauma and have strategies to support those students. We continue to provide power perception sessions twice each week in the evening for our black students, and we are planning to expand the current group of uh, secondary students to also include elementary students in the future. We've also provided all buildings with equity audit tools to review their reopening of school strategies for the school year. And we are, <clears throat> we are currently designing our systems efforts to build equity leadership capacity through our comprehensive coordinated early intervention intervening services funds and our DPI homeless grant. Through these supports, we are developing three major initiatives. We'll be training district leadership through the Wisconsin RTI Center's Building Culturally Responsive Systems Workshop in the spring. Um, we'll be professionally developing principals to develop their capacity to lead this work in their buildings. And we're working to develop building leaders from all positions who want to advance this work in their schools and districts, in addition to requiring equity training for all staff uh, throughout the school year. We continue to work on policy development. <clears throat> to that end, we continue to refine the equitable, equitable multi-level system of support policy, which is replacing the retired instructional grouping policy. And as you listen to the following topics that follow this slide, uh, you'll hear equity addressed throughout the discussion as our work is much more, <clears throat> is much more than these items that I've just identified. So one of those areas where um, we see it addressed is in summer school. 
this was a really unusual summer. Uh, I have the District of Distinction logo on the top because of our, our summer school program in the past have been identified for its ability to remove barriers for students um, and increase equity for all students. We see summer school as an opportunity to do that. And this year, though, summer school is quite unusual with 100% of our programming being virtual. We did um, meet the needs technologically of all students, both through devices and through de uh, delivery of hotspots to any student who identified the need. And in the, we were also asked in past summer presentations, what has been the impact of that summer programming? We did an analysis on our 2019 summer program because we have enough data now to look back on that. And we found two trends in particular. The first is we found that students who scored advanced on our STAR assessment, that's a screener that we provide um, two to three times throughout the school year. Those that scored advanced in the spring were more likely to attend, attend summer school the following summer. Likewise, students who did attend summer school stayed relatively stable in their proficiency status as measured by the spring star assessment to the fall. In general, there was not a slide. I mean, it wasn't ideal. It wasn't that way for every student, but overall there was not a, a, a noticeable slide, though there were fluctuations we did see in some performances. So our future analysis is gonna compare these findings with students not in summer school to see if those students experienced a slide um, and to attract more students to the programming from all levels of achievement. Removing barriers has always been a focus for our in-person programming, which provides transportation for many of our students and meals for all students. And that transportation we're looking to expand this summer. It also provides programming at no cost with minimal material fees for some of our partnerships. So as we looked at our enrollment in summer programming, it went down quite a bit this year because we went to that 100% virtual programming. Um, not everything could be shifted quickly to a virtual setting. Typically, uh, the closure happened in mid-March. Typically, uh, we are registering students a half, over a half of a month earlier. Our staff rallied to create as many offerings as possible in the virtual setting, and this often included creating materials and either sending them home or having them available for contact less pickup. We peaked last summer with our enrollment of 2019, and that even included a one-week cancellation due to the many snow days that finished the, in 2019. This year, our enrollment in courses was 47% compared to 2019, and the number of unique students was 62% compared to the prior summer. So why we saw those changes, in other words, less students took multiple courses. So in 2019, two out of every five enrollments was taken by a student who had enrolled in one course already. Last summer, it was only one in five had taken the second course. So um, this was consistent with what we saw in terms of those limited number of offerings, of course. Our partnership program did see significant reductions as well. Um, as you can see, there are many asterisks, asterisks uh, this last summer, as many partners struggled to offer virtual programming. And as you know, many of these partners identifying this list were actually closed. So they were unable to even consider offering any virtual programming. In light of this, we did have some amazing opportunities for students, including camp invention. We sent kits directly to the students' homes. CVTC was well positioned to deliver programming in the virtual space for our high school students and increased participation significantly over the last summer, as did our Hmong language partnership with the Eau Claire Hmong Mutual Assistance Association and through the, um, through the talent of Jackson Yang, one of our outstanding young teachers in the district. The Chippewa Valley Museum, UW Eau Claire's Blue Gold Beginnings and Upward Bound and UW Stout all did an amazing job transforming programming to meet the needs of interest students. And finally, as mentioned earlier on our equity slide, we had a very active participation two times each week with the Power Perception Program led by Dennis Beal. Due to the reduction in programming, we also saw a reduction in our staffing needs. It is interesting to note how much summer programming has, gone, gone, has grown as this past summer was very similar to 2016, which was a typical summer. Um, and yet we consider this last summer as being drastically reduced to what is now our normal. While our certified staffing was just over 70% of 2019, our assistants were hired at about a third of the rate of the prior summer's rates. This is primarily due to special education and the reduced need for logistical supports like breakfast, lunch, and bus supervision, and behavioral supports provided by our special education assistants, which were not needed in the virtual setting. 
So next, Kay is going to walk you through how staffing was addressed as we move from summer to the 2021 school year. Thanks, Jim. Um, so as we look at staffing from the 1920 uh, school year, um, in the past, I provided information related to the staff turnover rate and did so in a five-year summary. Um, last year was the first time that we were able to provide the information for you in a school year format in conjunction with um, a fiscal year format. So I wanted to be able to, again this year, compare both of those um, so that you could see both pieces of information. So as you know, the fiscal year is July to June, where the school year is August to September. So if you look at the data before you, you can see that the school year um, was a significant decrease in turnover from 1819 um, in both the fiscal year as well as the school year calendar measurements. So um, the data before you, if you look at the FTE turnover um, in the fiscal year from um, going from 1819, if you look at the 1819 year, there were 72 FTE turnovers. Out of those 72, 24 of those were retirements. So the percentage of turnover was eight and a half percent. And then in 1920, we dropped down to an FT, FTE turnover of 61 FTEs. And out of those 21.6 of those were retirements. So the percentage of turnover was 7.14%. So again, that first grid is um, the fiscal year. But then if you look at the second grid, which is then the school year, um, looking at the data in a school year context, the 1819 school year goes from 82.9% in FTE, which is a 9.78 percentage, to then in 2019-20 to a 7.0% um, turnover rate. So again, regardless of whether we're looking at it in the fiscal um, data or in the school year data, um, both of those show that uh, there's, you know, a, a decrease in the amount of turnover from um, the 1819 to the 1920 school year. And now that we're in the 2021 school year, uh, again, fiscally, you can look at it as 12.7 FTE to this point in the year so far for a 2.06%. And then again, if we look at it from the school year, again, to just this point in the year, um, a 0.57% turnover rate. So we continue to um, document that data as we go forward so that we can share that information with you again next school year. But um, we are happy to see the continuing decrease in that trend compared to where we were back in 2015-16, which was before the new compensation plan. Um, so we do we do like that ongoing decrease that um, that we do see in that turnover rate. Then the next slide, um, there was information that was asked, um, I think it was at the last board meeting, about if we know the reasons why people are leaving when they do choose to leave us um, in addition to just retirement. And I had indicated that that is something that we track when people share that information with us, and this is that information. So. For the 1920 school year, out of the um, information that was made known to us in the documentation that was provided, um, we had 59.8 FTEs um, that turned over in that school year for, that made up that 7.0% turnover rate. So out of those FTEs, we indicated that they were choosing to stay at home with family. Um, another 3% or 3 FTEs indicated that they were um, leaving us for health related issues of either themselves or a family member. 3.5 of those FTEs were moving to another district. And then 18.4 indicated that they were just uh, resigning from the district and did not state a reason for us to be able to document. 23.5 um, of those FTEs were uh, specifically for retirement. And then 8.4 compiled a category of other, which would be, you know, one or two here or there that didn't um, 
straight enough to make a, a theme for that. Um, I am happy to indicate that the position in another district FTE has decreased. Um, each year we continue to see that number drop. Um, so I'm happy to see that people are not choosing to leave us to go to another district as they have been um, several years ago. Um, so we would consider that to be progress in that area. And I believe the next slide is me, Kim. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And so I would like to talk a little bit um, tonight about enrollment trends for the 2021 school year. You can see that according to our third Friday count this year, we're serving 11,319 students from pre-kindergarten through grade 12. As you can see here, um, we have enrollment trends over the past several years. And then a comparison of that enrollment to the projections from the Applied Populations Lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. You can see that our enrollment did dip this year. Um, and we believe that it's due to the pandemic. Several families explored options that met their needs during this time, whether it was virtual schools offered by other districts, um, homeschooling their student or enrolling them in neighborhood districts with more in-person um, programming. We saw a decline in about 375 students this year. And as with all things pan <clears throat> pandemic, we can't predict what choices these families will make in the spring or even next school year or when the pandemic is uh, no longer a concern. You can see here how the students that we do have in our district are dispersed throughout the district. So there's a small disclaimer with this graph. Um, the total here might not reflect the number reported out on the previous slide, Third Friday membership. Um, it's due to a variety of factors, including the weight or FTE that um, Third Friday gives to some grade levels, open enrollment in and out and other factors. Um, the easiest way to describe this graph is the number of children in seats at any one point in time. So what you would see here today or tonight might look a little bit different tomorrow based on enrollments or withdrawals and so on. So if you look at the grade level specifically, you'll notice that some of the bars stand out from others. Um, the class of 2026 continues to be our largest class. Those students are now seventh graders and they've consistently um, had a higher enrollment than all the other grade levels um, for several years. And then you'll also notice a significant difference in our 4K numbers compared to other classes. Um, many families indicated that they were keeping their children home this year rather than sending them to 4K. Um, we anticipate that as the pandemic resolves, we'll see the enrollment in that particular graduating class increase. And we imagine it'll mirror many of the other grade levels, um, but we do see that decline this year. Um, and then finally on this graph, the blue bars are the number of students that are part of the face-to-face -face or blended program at each grade level. And the orange part of the bar represents the number of students that are participating in the 100% virtual program. So roughly, um, there's just over 80% of our students that are in the blended model at this point in time, and just under 20% of our students serve through the 100% virtual model. And I wanted to break that down a little bit more. Um, like I said, we have approximately 2,000 students engaged in the 100% virtual learning option this year. This graph here compares the demographics of the district as a whole in blue um, to the demographics of students in the 100% virtual model in green. So you'll notice some differences in the data and some significant. Um, for example, while 39.4% of students in the district as a whole receive free and reduced lunch, 58.1% of our virtual learners do. And while 9.9% of students in the district are Asian, 30.1% of students in the virtual program are Asian. 13.5% of students in the district as a whole have an IEP, while 15.7% of students in virtual programming re receive support through an individualized plan. And although 3.9% of students in the district are English learners. 10.8% of students in the virtual program receive programming through EL. 
So our virtual classrooms you can see here are more diverse than our face-to-face -face classrooms right now. Many students in the 100% virtual program bring unique needs to the classroom and they're eager to learn. You may recall um, that families were first asked to indicate their choice for an instructional model by August 5th. And before the start of the school year, more than 700 students requested to change instructional models. And we accommodated all of those requests. Since then, um, you can see here that we continue to receive requests through the form on the district website, albeit at a slower rate. Last week, the team that you see listed here um, met to review the requests that were submitted between August 28th and the end of September. And while we were able to move some students to a different instructional model, we did decline many. The last bullet here helps to explain why that might be. Um, and I'll, I'll try to explain that in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> when an elementary request is made, the team really needs to look at two classroom teachers, one in the current model that the student is in and one in the new model. And it's very easy for the team to look at the number of seats in both classrooms to determine if that switch is possible. You can see in some cases in September, we were able to make that switch. In fact, for the majority of students at elementary, we were able to make the switch for people that requested a change. At sixth and seventh grade, when a request is made, we actually need to look at eight classrooms that could be impacted by the request four core instructors in the blended model and four core instructors who are in the virtual model. While some of those instructors may have seats available, we had to guarantee that all teachers in all four areas could accommodate another student. And you can see here at sixth and seventh grade, we were able to accommodate the switch for some students, but not for all. And then beginning in eighth grade and throughout high school, this becomes a much more complex process. Um, these are the grades where we start to see several courses meet the requirement for a core class. Um, for example, a freshman um, could be taking Algebra 1, they could be taking Geometry, or they could be taking Algebra 2 and Trig, all for their math requirement. Or to meet a social studies requirement, um, a senior could be taking Econ, AP Econ, Psychology, Sociology, or AP Psych. And so when the team began to look at available seats in either the virtual or blended model, it required 100% hand scheduling. Most often, um, we were able to find available, availability for a student in some courses, but not all. And so you can see um, this resulted in only 24 requests being granted. Any changes beyond that would have required changes in staffing, which would then result in changes in schedules for students, um, both for those that made a request to change and for the students that didn't request to change. So based on previous feedback and frustration from students and families and staff um, with schedule changes um, in early September, the remainder of the requests were declined. We anticipate that we'll continue to get requests for instructional model changes, and those requests will be reviewed um, at both levels on November 1st. And then moving forward, we'll look toward the end of marking periods. So the end of first and second trimester for elementary and the end of um, second and third quarters for secondary. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to dig into the virtual program a little bit more. Um, as you know, at the last board meeting, you approved the appointment of Laura Schlifting and Travis Hetke as virtual program administrators, um, and I'm overseeing the program. Um, the technology team has done a fabulous job of ensuring each one of our students and staff have a device assigned to them, and they've also deployed hotspots for students in the virtual program. Um, and so we would just like to talk with you a little bit more about what that program is shaping up to be. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Laura, um, who will talk specifically about the virtual program at the elementary level. Laura? Thanks, Kim. Um, I've just been really very honored to have the opportunity over the last couple of weeks to talk with families and virtual teachers and district leadership about the start of our virtual learning. 
and have learned a great deal about what's been going well and identifying areas where we can grow. Um, as a result, you'll begin to see some shifts in our elementary virtual learning. As you saw in the previous slide, we have a very diverse group of learners in our virtual learning program. And so in order to respond to that, what you're going to see is the amount of asynchronous and synchronous learning shift a bit. In order for more equitable practices, you'll find that new learning will be recorded and posted on the learning management system, whether it's Canvas or Seesaw, versus having it all presented in a face-to-face -face large group session. By making this shift, we can have it more accessible to families when it meets their schedule. And it also allows students to replay or review that new learning as often as they need for a review, a clarification, or just better understanding. By having this new learning posted and available to families um, whenever they, they need it, the large group setting of all the students together can now shift into synchronous groups that are small group and focused on skill, focused for individual student or group needs. So you'll see students of seven or eight in a group versus all 40, for example. We're in the middle of our fall assessments right now. And so this is a great time to use that data look at our at our groupings and make those small groups that can be very responsive to student needs and that includes their social emotional as well as their academic areas for growth some of the systems pieces that we've dug into in the last week or so um, first and foremost has been a sub plan for the virtual learning program um, just like in brick and mortar we have needs for substitute teachers and um, we know that that is a challenge right now so we've worked with our teams to have them work collaboratively um, so that they, they are creating and sharing lessons among their learning management systems. They can get into each other's platforms, can manage those pages, as well as support the students. So when we have a short-term absence, they can help each other um, on those days that there may or may not be a sub available. As Kim mentioned, we took time in the last week or so to review the request to change cohorts. And we're also pleased to share that this week we're launching a biweekly newsletter that is just another communication tool for families. So it's been a busy couple of weeks, but we're excited about the progress that we have ahead of us and the achievement that our students are going are going to see. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Travis Hedke. I was uh, assigned to this about two and a half weeks ago, so it's been kind of a fast and furious couple weeks. A um, lot of learning on my part, a um, lot of learning in working with uh, school administration and school counselors. So I've had the chance to kind of conduct a needs assessment, and I've enjoyed my time getting in uh, weekly to schools to visit with the administrative teams and counselors, um, seeing what the needs are in the buildings of not only our 100% virtual teachers, but all those also those ones that are also maybe teaching some in face to face and also a hybrid model of the virtual. Um, I'm also looking at one on one in group meetings with 100% virtual teachers. Uh, one of the great things today that I was able to do and once last week was Bobby Sebesta who teaches social studies seven and eight in the 100% virtual model. Um, she invited me into her classroom. I was able to talk with students and kind of get their feel of what it's working well, uh, pros and cons. And of course, one of the pros is they get to sleep in a little later. That was one of the things they mentioned. Um, not getting up at 630 and catching a bus. Also, just the safety and health of them and their family members if they're needed to um, stay virtual. Um, other things that they kind of mentioned as far as some of the cons, the technology issues that keep arising. Um, you know, not being able to maybe get into a Teams meeting or things like that. But IT has worked uh, countless hours helping. They've been a huge uh, help to my teachers uh, that I'm working with. They're doing a great job. They're very responsive. So every day seems to get a little smoother with that. And hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have everything ironed out with that. The next thing we had to look at was really the Apex Online Learning. And Student Representative, Representative Emery uh, Tool did mention that there was some kind of hiccups with that. We have communicated and I've communicated 
strictly with my contact at Apex as far as students feeling that um, they're behind. I've communicated with the instructors and they have assured me that they're trying to push off some of those activities to make sure that students are able to um, be caught up and be in the right spot um, when the national test comes in May. So I feel pretty good about where they'll end up by the end, but it has been a little bumpy to start. Um, textbooks and things like that are on order. Uh, a lot of the students have gotten some of those textbooks and as they come in, our library media staff have done a fantastic job of making sure that they get them barcoded right away and we send out an email so students can come and pick those up at district office. So what you'll notice is that um, there are 91 students currently taking about 116 courses and that's in six advanced placement areas. Uh, psychology, government, calculus AB, history, chemistry, and then also biology. The biggest ones being psychology and government with approximately 30 or 40 students in each of those. Um, next slide there. So as far as the needs, a lot of PD around that technology piece, the Canvas, Skyward, StudySync. We've had some teachers that have been repurposed from elementary schools up to middle school. Um, and, and those have been a challenge. Um, again, IT staff has been fantastic. We've also had a lot of our teachers who are in the building teaching step up, um, offer assistance, uh, department chairs and things like that to share kind of their information and, and the needs and things to make sure they're supporting their 100% hybrid or 100% uh, teachers in that area. Other needs, guidelines, uh, definitely for synchronous versus asynchronous learning. And that's really an education of families to ensure the equity among all learners. Um, Staff and families, I think this has looked very different than what they're used to. So it's really a mindset shift and for all stakeholders and just understanding what that synchronous versus asynchronous means. Uh, we have the schedule, but it doesn't mean that students need to be on that device, you know, for seven hours a day. And then the other thing we have done, like Laura alluded to, is developing that biweekly newsletter for families. And that will be going out tomorrow. So that would be a huge communication piece that will help in some of those areas. Uh, communication uh, is one of those tools that we have to be continuing using. And so we'll continue to do that uh, right around the board meeting dates and we'll keep that going. The last thing is the change of cohorts. Um, like Kim had mentioned, we reviewed those family requests. We've developed that process and then really just collaborating with school counselors on what that process of notifying families of those changes and how we can assist those students. That's what I got, thank you. So I think the um, we're muted, I think, on the uh, exec team room, it looks like. So we actually haven't heard anything for about 90 seconds now. So really since the end of uh, Mr. Hedke's presentation. Here, James. Somebody's coming. Do you want to test it now? Are you able to hear me? Yep, we're good now. Thank you. It went right on its own. It's usually what my family likes at home is for me to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. Okay. Um, actually, yes, I'd like, well, no, this will, this will be fine, Marissa. You can keep it right there. Thank you. It's me, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's a good thing you're more than six feet away. <laughs> <laughs> I got long arms. Yeah, go for it. Um, although I detailed a different iteration of the transition plan two weeks ago in public forum and shared a more comprehensive draft document with the board this past Friday, I would like to highlight three areas of fo focus since our last board meeting. Uh, the first is the dial. Um, on the next slide, thank you. After discussion with uh, the board in the past, parent student committee, system leaders, and the ECAE, we made some slight modifications to level three, the gold, uh, I'm sorry, level three. Um, instead of stating level three as strictly a secondary virtual model, as we had done in the past, we gave ourselves more flexibility for one or more cohorts, grade levels, or individual schools, 
to then go virtual. We believed it would be less confusing for staff and families and more realistic given how the virus and quarantine effects could emerge from a staffing standpoint. The next slide illustrates the decision-making framework. Uh, the items in bold on the left side are all critical and will be utilized in the event of any change. The communication refinement item on the bottom left is something we will continue for the board, regardless of level, whether number one for face-to-face -face or four for a district-wide closure. Another example of gaining parental feedback is sharing the document and our progress with our first Family Advisory Council meeting tomorrow evening. The next slide is one example and quite possibly the most critical of the main readiness metrics out of seven, the ability to staff our schools and to keep them covered. The others include instructional preparedness, digital enablement, service readiness, and state account requirements. And as Jim had alluded to at the beginning, um, was that focus on equity, a major equity component that we're addressing in, uh, in, in two of these would be the digital enablement which would be the internet, hotspots, and computers, and the service readiness indicator like food and nutrition services. So getting back to this, after discussion with 45 system leaders in our district, the first indicator, staffing coverage, is most critical. We determine that due to COVID infections or staff quarantine. We need to examine the absences for a short-term closure and act when a school staff absences require external assistance, like neighboring schools available staff member or district office personnel chipping in to help for four consecutive student days. You may ask why four? Because Mondays and Fridays are generally higher for staff absence due to personal days or other scheduled staff appointments. We wanted to ensure that a Tuesday and a Thursday could be included for a more substantive and realistic sample. Our virtual Wednesday is viewed as a natural opportunity where a quarantine staff member could possibly be released, or a weekend test result could be given for another staff member, allowing us to reduce our substitute need and not having to close a school. If situations were to improve in the district that would allow for full face-to-face -face instruction via the Eau Claire City County Health Recommendations, Step F, we would most likely defer to the originally adopted calendar from, the, from early in the winter of 2020. If we were to approach level E, then F in the health department metric, we'd be notified ahead of time by that leadership to communicate to families and pre prepare adequately for our future plans. We have learned this from Hudson as well, as they announced a shift from a five-day model last Wednesday to implement a hybrid model today. Secondly, although we're spending a significant amount of effort on a four-level transition plan in the event of a short-term closure because of the spread of, in Wisconsin, the transition plan must and will also be fashioned to return to a five-day in-person learning level two. Planning for a possible closure is far more intricate than planning for five days a week of face-to-face. -face. Kay and Jim illustrated this quite well earlier this evening. However, the board will be provided the progress preparations and changes between the four levels continually in public. At this point, we will take questions and comments from the board on our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Questions and comments from the board. Commissioner Clements? Uh, can you please go back to the slide where you had the composition of the virtual learning environment in terms of their um, demographics. Did, did this um, surprise staff in terms of uh, a larger percentage of students receiving free and reduced lunch being uh, participating in the virtual model as, as compared to our student population? Um, I, I think when we learned um, and saw this data, it was a surprise, but as we dug into it a little bit more, it's it's not exceptional. Um, this is mirroring what districts all over the state and actually all over the United States are, are seeing with the, the makeup of those who um, are choosing the 100% virtual model or those who are choosing 
uh, a hybrid or blended sort of model. Uh, as a follow-up question, do we have yet any insight as to um, why this is, is playing out uh, in this manner? The hypothesis we hear from uh, when we talk to specialists in the field is that the populations that choose 100% virtual have also been the populations most affected by COVID-19. And so it's it tends to be more of a safety. There's a variety of other factors that may be, but that one seems to rise to the top. Dr. Johnson. Yeah, first, uh, first set of questions here. Could if we go to uh, slide fourteen? Can did, did I hear correctly? There will be so there's going to be a continuation of allowing uh, parents and families to request in and out of blended and in, 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 in virtual models. Is that what I heard correctly? That is true. We're going to move to logical breaks um, within. Um, the school year though so rather than doing it simply at the end of a month we'll look to um like i said end of the marking period or that sort of thing all right and so then i i, I guess why what why why is there a reason for the, the continuation of, uh, of of accepting requests i guess the the difficulty that i'm, I'm finding given the uh larger large amounts of requests but then the the results of those requests are still a large percentage that find themselves uh, 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 not uh, their requests not being uh, honored or selected uh, and then it's that state of limbo that potentially can happen as one continues to await a fate that may not actually happen so I'm just I'm, at, at some point in time do we just say, you uh, 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 you're, you're at where you're at and uh, uh, we will do our best to ensure the best learning experience. So I'm, I'm, I'm just curious what that decision was in terms of the continuous accepting of the application. And then I guess just a, fo a, a follow up on another piece. What's the uh, additional substitute, substitute teacher training for, because I guess this was the first time that I heard that uh, I, I think one of the individuals spoke about the virtual substitute teaching. What what additionally has to happen to get a substitute teacher up to speed to do virtual substitution? Sure. I can talk about the um, moving between instructional models, and then I'll talk. I'll let Kay talk about um, substitutes. So um, the beginning with this month now, um, we have. Um, asked families to indicate why they would be requesting a move for instructional models. Um, and um, I'll just read you kind of what the reasons could be or their options that they can select. One is a newly diagnosed or worsening medical condition of either the student or a member of the immediate household. So we do know that we will have some families that will have um, changes in their medical status that might require them um, to request a change in instructional model, and we wanted to be able to honor that. Um, and the uh, second one would be to move siblings so that the entire household is under the same instructional model. As we've moved students, there were times where perhaps a family had three children or four children that they wanted to move, but we may have um, only been able to accommodate um, one or two of them. And so if those families would like us to review just to get all students on the same schedule within the household, that would be another reason that we would um, honor or look to honor a request if possible. A third reason is a fresh start with supporting documentation from a principal or a school counselor. If one instructional model simply is not working out well for a student, we have had that a couple of times where um, it, it just isn't working out the way that the family thought it would. Um, we used, um, we have a spot for the family to check that. And then um, the third or the last one is the fourth one is um, something called um, at the state level, it's called tuition waiver. 
basically what that means is um, that you started the school year in one school district who's already counted you as a, a student in their district um, and your family moved out of the district. And so you would just like to be able to continue um, to, to attend the Eau Claire School District, even though you, you live in another district. So it's a tuition waiver. It's a formality thing that we deal with in all models, um, but we wanted to put that down as an option as well. Okay, do you want to substitute? Sure. Um, early on in the beginning of the school year, um, our HR team, um, in conjunction with the district's IT department, partnered with EDU staff to be able to indicate what it was that was going to be needed from an IT training component for any of our substitutes who were agreeing to continue to work with us in the district and would um, be interested in teaching virtually in either a 100% virtual situation or in the hybrid model if a virtual component was necessary from that format. And so there have been ongoing training sessions provided by our sub vendor edge staff um, for any substitutes who were willing to be trained in the um, technology and um, virtual components that are needed to be able to support our students who are in those models. And those trainings have been um, highly attended by people in our substitute pool who are willing to continue to work to support our students in those venues. So those components have been going on since, I'm going to say mid-August, um, maybe the third week of August. I'm not sure exactly how often they occur, um, but I do know that when they happen, um, that EDU staff has indicated that they are very highly attended. Good morning. Yeah, you can go ahead. I have no else in the line. All right. So, uh, if we could go to slide uh, slide number four uh, in your presentation, uh, the district course enrollment. I guess I missed it, or I, and I, I I I'm not sure. But did, did, did could you guys define the uh, could you define unique? Yep. What was what was unique? 2019 and what was unique 2020 well 2020 makes sense but what was what's the unique what made up the unique for 2019 it's the unique number of students taking a course so it doesn't so the the blue bar graphs are the number of times a course was taken um but as course may, you may have a student taking more than one course and so the green bar graphs represent the number of unique students taking courses and so um and so that's what that is so that the total, the total of green cannot exceed um, our, our total population of students, whereas the blue potentially could. Because if students took more than one class, it could exceed that. Yeah. You're welcome to continue if you have additional questions. No problem. All right, other comments or questions? I want to say thank you for your hard work in bringing all this data to us, uh, meeting after meeting. Uh, a lot of it is not unexpected, you know, the drops in our summer school and potentially our overall enrollment. Um, but it's important that we know that and then we can use that as a milestone and a bar to set uh, for next, next year. So I really appreciate all the work that all of you and the executive team have put into bringing that to us. Thank you very much. At this time, I would ask for requests for future agenda items. Just like both Zoe and Emery uh, mentioned, that the students seem to be settling into their new routines. There's still challenges and ways to go. It seems like we are also settling into uh, this year, Dr. Johnson, were you about to, I may have cut you off on an agenda item. I was just going to, if we could just be provided a, a, just a, 
an update specifically about the uh, about the cohorts. And I'm I'm curious to know or is it on a, a, a on a dashboard somewhere? But in terms of capacity levels between the A B uh, uh, cohort uh, at uh, uh, at each uh, at each school level or at, least, at least each grade level, if we could get a little bit more information uh, uh, just about that in terms of is it, it does one cohort is one cohort potentially at a uh, uh, at a higher capacity uh, compared to uh, compared to another in terms of. Talking about the raw number of yeah. students that are is a is the a cohort slightly larger than the b cohort yeah. or vice versa? Yeah, okay. I'm just curious. Too. Okay, uh, we can certainly find that information and either present that at a board meeting or uh, as an information item on the dashboard, like you said. Other requests? Then I would hear a motion to adjourn. It's nine fifty-five. So moved. Okay. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, aye. 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 We're adjourned. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the Eau Claire Area School Board. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.